I'm hoping you're all in a good mood and enjoying yourselves. And I'm also going to say I'm going to be quite practical, okay? Tonight I'm not on Discord afterwards. Tonight I am also not going past roughly... Eh, probably 11 o'clock, because... Well, I have to make sure the fluffs all both get their final, you know, big pats, hugs, and all those things in before I get on a plane tomorrow morning. And I'm leaving home tomorrow morning at 7am. Yes, I'm off to Australia. And in answer to the first thing, Night 6831, I haven't scheduled brew ships or anything like that, or any lives, whilst I'm away. Because I don't know what exactly the time is going to be, and what I'm going to be doing. However, I fly in and I land in Perth on Saturday. I have allocated, because most of Sunday, to having a bit of a rest of the day wander around Perth and sorting things out. So, if I'm feeling up to it, you might well find an evening I turn on, and if the hotel internet is up to it, and we're in a hotel we're in, should have good enough uh, internet connection, I might turn on and do a quick questions. So, but I don't know what time of day that will be compared to what time of day it is now. And hello, and welcome to the 1st of June. So I'm just going to do the toggle the timestamps. Just give me a second. I don't know. Sorry. Again, I, I do not recommend doing things uh, doing things in dusty circumstances with dogs. It's just not good. Hello, Pete Dawson. Hello, Timmy Luca. Hello, Abuzaski. Hello, hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, Manchester Dostel. Michael Cooch. Byron Newman. Hello. Um, I will probably need a lot of iron brew for the first brew ships of getting back. I will. I'll make sure to book in a, in a couple of bottles so it. Uh, Mike Gooch. Uh, considering the Fluffy researchers' reaction to Daddy's being gone for the longest time in the world, followed by, and now he's back, how long will Fluffy excitement over last, last until after the Ulster trip? Um, well, let's put it this way. I get back from Oz, and then I'm possibly off to do some more filming for TV, and then I get back from that, and then I'm off to be a course director for Justin Craig, I think, in August. So yeah, they're probably going to just get done. Uh, get ex the excitement's probably just going to dip down. They're not going to disappear again. And come back. They're going to be in a perpetual state of excitement. I'm back. Uh, my gooch, Gloria, Avram, 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 Hello, my gooch, Gloria, what do you know what the English call it? The French didn't think quite so close. What did they call the battle? Uh, they called it the fourth battle of Urshant, uh, the Battle du Fourteenth Parel, and Combat de Parel. Um, also, you have to consider that the French considered it. Well, there's a reason why I've got it. Is it the Age of Sail Battle of Jutland? And, well, there is the fact that the French will always tell you that the 1st of June is a strategic victory because the convoy gets through. And I'm going to lead out the points. I'm not going to say what I, can I think, but I'm going to leave it all for you to decide as we go through. So... The French sent out a battle fleet to cover a grain convoy coming back from America to France. That grain convoy is essential because France is starving. It needs to get to the channel ports to be able to reach the areas of France which are starving. Remember, France has terrible internal infrastructure like every country does at this time. If it doesn't move by sea, it ain't getting anywhere. The British sent out a battle fleet to intercept it. The battle fleet doesn't manage to find the grain convoy, but does find, out, does find a battle fleet sent out to cover the convoy. They have a fight, the British win the fight. The convoy manages to slip past while the fight's going on. And they manage to get in to Atlantic French ports, not Channel French ports. And they deliver their grain. Unfortunately, it then spoils 
on the way to Paris, etc., and so they don't get the grain supplies where they need to go. However, the French claim it's the, strategic, it's the battle was a strategic victory and validated their idea of their concept of what matters is doing the operations, not necessarily winning the battles, because the grain, uh, the grain got through to France. The reason it went into Atlantic ports rather than Channel ports is because there was another squadron of British coming out who were coming to reinforce Lord Howe's squadron. So it's a it's a fun scenario to work it out. Is it a strategic loss for British? The grain the grain convoy, which was their target, didn't get didn't get stopped. It didn't get destroyed. But there again, it also didn't get to the ports they need to get. And is it a, a pure tactical victory for the British because they win so many ships? But there's also the fact that they could have won a lot more and they did lose quite a bit as well. In terms of damage. So that's an interesting. It's an interesting one. Hello Wayne. Hello Timmy Locker. Hello Tana Verka. Hello DG40. Hello Paul from Chicago. Um, hello Mila Burrow. Hello. Ooh. This was supposed to start at 7.15. But I managed to find liquid more quickly. So I started earlier. And I also want to give you as much time as I can do before I have to finish for the evening. Well, that means a 4 a.m. wake up. Well, yes, it does pretty much with the um, fluffs. <laughs> Where's all the sun? Translation, one around per, finance and producer supply. You are seeing through me rather too well, Wayne. You are, you are basically, that is, that is, there is a real, there are many considerations as to why I'm arriving in a Perth early, but finding, an, uh, finding somewhere in Perth which does stock iron brew is important to me. I know where they stock iron brew in Brisbane, I know where they stock iron brew in Melbourne, and I know where they stock iron brew in Sydney, but I do not know where there is in Perth. <laughs> Perth is seven, Australia, Perth, Australia is seven hours ahead of the UK, yes. So, 7 o'clock over there, starting will be the same as starting doing the video at lunchtime here. I'm going for, are you going to see HMS Vampire? Yes, I am. I'm going to see HMS Vampire. That's going to be in Sydney. We're going to go see her. Hello, Bob Fry. Hello, New IQB4472. Uh, let's put it this way. Um... Drac is trying his best to keep me away from HMS Vampire. He keeps going, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And I'm going, nope, I'm going to see Vampire. You can do what you like. I will be, I, 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 in, the moment I'm in Sydney, I will be, I, I might have a hotel room, but if they'll let me sleep on her, I'll be sleeping on her. If you lose a fleet as part of each operation, how many operations can you do? Well, that is the uh, question, isn't it? Hannah Lizzie Mitchell. What should we go? Mahantra has a lot of time talking about this battle. I'm inclined to agree with the Great Admiral in this case. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Avora Puffel. It feels like this battle might have been a strategic victory that was pretty much negated. Pretty much is my view sometimes. Can I have a Colin Cameron? Hannah San Canero. Hannah Steve Clark. And Masha Dostal, and Grace Sarsky, and Oliver Braun, and Rich C. Richards. So. Without much further ado. Shamus Book Plug. Um, as you all know, I'm a contract lecturer. And I will say this has been brought into special highlight recently because contract lecturers, we only get paid when we go into work, right? And for most universities, what they do to get so that we don't become permanent members of staff by default and various other things within their own rules, uh, we technically get um, our, our contracts end, let's say, in about the about the uh, third Monday in July, and they're not renewed till the third Monday in September. Now, as a rule, 
there are various methods universities can find for employing someone still in the meantime between that. Um, various options. And continue employment. Some even just, you know, just all sorts of random things they can do while still technically keeping within the rules of that contract. Uh, it's all very interesting, and I'm fairly sure very much in the grey area of, legal of accounting legality. But we'll leave that to one side. Now, for most of the unis I do work with, me going off for a month didn't cause any problem at all. They're going, that's ah, fine, we don't have to pay you for that month because you're not going with us. That's fine. Okay, I budgeted for it. I worked it out. It was okay. One university has decided to this year end my contract early because of it. And, well, I'll be also talking about this a bit in the sort of the... Uh, in, because it happened yesterday, and I was re-recording what will be the um, the Warhammer Imperial Fleet um, video, which is going out on the 6th of June yesterday. And so it sort of kind of ended up getting mentioned there because it was on my mind. But uh, literally, I got a phone call yesterday, and this, this is the example I give of academic, why tenure is kind of useful, but also why the idea that academics have any more job security than anyone else is kind of twaddle. Um, basically, I had a phone call yesterday. Not even really a phone call, because it wouldn't have been a phone call if I hadn't uh, if I hadn't asked one. It would have been a WhatsApp message informing me that um, pretty much, if I wanted to work for them the rest of the year, um, fill out my employment for my official contract. I needed to cancel Australia as they just realised that there was only one person left in my department and they couldn't cover it. And, um... Yeah. My answer was no. And, honestly, I think they were a little shocked. But the reason I was confident enough to do that, I was happy enough to do that, is because of all your support. Because you're all interested in naval history, because you enjoy watching these channel, these videos, because of the kindness and support you've shown on the the pr trip, and because of people buying the book. By the way, the reason that the Australian museums can't find any copies for me to sign, and while we're there, and if you're coming there and want to sign copies of books, bring your own, because the Australian museums won't have any for sale because the entire the entirety of Australia has sold out. Apparently, all copies of my book in the Antipodean peninsulas. And the anti all the Antipodean islands, all the Antipodean spaces, have all sold out. Every part of my, every part of the Antipodean territories, have sold out of my book. Uh, you cannot overestimate the amount of time I spent winding up <clears throat> a very senior academic with that um, point yeah, uh, point in a meeting yesterday. That was a lot of, uh, please, please note, that academic is from a different university than the one who phoned me to tell me that I wasn't going to be employed for the rest of the year, teaching uh, term of the year because I was going away for a month. By the way, before people start saying, well, you should have told them earlier, uh, I told them in January. I would booked the time off in January. They knew about it from January. And they turned around on May the 31st and were telling me to cancel. And it was a case of, no. But this is why this all matters and why your support really does matter. Yes, uh, important history does do a, does a very good work. And I'm glad when I, when I see them using my book it's, and stuff, it makes me very happy. My mom was, what is the condition of Atreus Vampire's engine and can you get them restarted? Uh, they're gonna let me go all over her. They've promised I can get right down into the bilges. They have told me to bring old clothes for HMS Vampire. Because she's a daring class. You can see, did, 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 she's the last one of these, the one at the back. It's gonna be fun. It's the, quite literally, they're, they're, they're looking forward because they're quite literally gonna take me around going, and we quite literally have the person who wrote the book on these ships here. 
And also in Brisbane, I can give you something because I've got some. I've got a um, early details. In Brisbane, we're going to be giving a talk. We're going to be giving a talk. So if you're in Queensland Maritime Museum, uh, thank you, Michael Coach. That's, thank you. It's very kind of me. But more, uh, but the thing is, if you're in Queensland Maritime Museum, uh, if you want to come see us there. There, 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 there. Yeah, yeah, there. On the Wednesday, the 14th of June, one thirty. Uh, it's currently billed as one thirty to 2.30pm, but might be a bit later than that. Um, include, uh, access included in your general admission to the museum. This will be, we will be, I will be giving a talk on flower class corvettes and the sloop story. Uh, Drac will be giving a talk on how Hood was destroyed. And Dan Freeman will be giving a talk on a rose by any other name. So, if you're able to get to Queens of the Maritime Museum, this is the first thing we, we can announce. We're gonna, there's going to be more talks as well in Australia. But there's the first ones we can announce that they have put out. There are details and it's going to be up there and everywhere. It's the Queens of the Maritime Museum on the 14th of June. Wednesday the 14th of June. We are going to be there. We are going to be giving a talk. Admission is included in your, your right to visit the talk is included in the price of your admission to the museum, which is all going towards helping the museum. And we love you to be there. So, anyone who can be there, anyone, if you know anyone out in Australia who might be interested in coming along, who's in sort of that area and might be interested in it, please tell them to come along. As I said, the talks are going to be me talking about flower class corvettes and the sloop story, Drac talking about how HMS Hood was destroyed. And Dad Freeman talking by Rose by any other name, the history of naming ships. <laughs> that should be live streamed. Um, we will see about whether they will let us allow us to live stream it. We hope it, we hope they will do. But the thing is, they are really trying to re they are trying to get a lot of support in for the museum. They are a wonderful little museum. They have lots of lovely little ships in there, and they need a lot of support. They have a lot of plans, a lot of things they need to restore. They've got a lot of big costs coming up with restoring ships, because maintaining museum-quality ships is not easy. It's very, very expensive. And, um, yeah, we need. Uh, we would love you. Uh, so, if anyone can want, that's going to be great. My good, it was my publisher who told me there was print sold out. They were really happy to tell me they were sold out because they've already ordered the second edition being printed. It just won't be out there till October. Um. So this is Battle Man um, made Amra Hall famous. To an extent, yes, but he wasn't that exactly unfamous before. I was asking, have those... Uh, yeah, uh, this, by the way, yeah, that is the uh, university employer who owes me a lot, owes me money. Uh, it, it's fun. They are the ones who've decided they don't want to have me any longer. And I have, a hint, I have a suspicion they might not renew my contract in September. I have that strong suspicion, in which case they will owe me... Enough money for it to be annoying, not enough money to probably justify me hiring a lawyer in the UK. And the thing is, even if I did try and take them to small claims court, they would try and basically lawyer out of it. How did you ship down there? They shipped actually quite a lot of books down there. I know that because I received the paycheck, the checks from them. Because for about every book that's bought, I get something like one pound forty, I think. I'm not quite sure. And um, yeah. And um, so I, I I saw the check I got from down there, which was fairly decent. So. I think it was definitely roughly. I think it was roughly about a a thousand or so books went down there. I know it was they, they. I know they sent down extra because of HMS Vampire, and they've all sought out. And apparently, the museum HMS Vampire mu museum in Sydney, which has HMS Vampire, never even saw the books. They never even had any. So now that they're they're ordering them for October now. Um, 
I'm coming. I guess I would say your Australia Economy Future Book Research will be more than how to pay for the fresh start the rest of the year from that uni. Oh, I hope so. Um, I teach master students over the summer. That's the thing. I usually teach the masters. Cool. I have two episodes of Belgians which are supposed to go live. For some reason, both uh, one has not gone live, and the other one, which is due to go live uh, in a week's time, in a two weeks' time, basically hasn't gone live. And then we are going to be do recording Belgians. Jamie is coming to see us in Sydney. Jamie is going to come see us in Sydney. We will probably record in Belgium. We might not record it in the Belgium, but we might record it from sitting on top of HMS Vampire. That's right. Will the talk be filmed for us on the watch? I think it definitely will be filmed. Whether or not it's live streamed is the question. As I was thinking, other man does anything. You also saw that in Poland. Easy thing, considering I'm probably the only copy. <laughs> I'll have to get some more sun out there. <sighs> right. Yes, Drac will be presenting his theory on that one. The publisher did not expect... The publisher honestly turned around and we went, um, we weren't actually expecting to have to do a second edition of your book. As it's your first public book, we weren't expecting to have to do anything like this and we're doing a second edition and there's a paperback version coming out as well as a hardback. They put, they're producing a paperback version of my book as well as the hardback. Which I consider pretty darn cool. I thought they, so they would represent me for the cost of a Chinese takeaway. And so it is tempting to use them, but it's also tempting to fit in the nicest way. Uh, whilst they'll cost me that in the UK, there is a thing of costs that can be awarded, uh, can be distributed to both sides. And I wouldn't be surprised if the university tried to ramp up the cost to make it to the point of even if I won money, I'd cut, I'd just pay so much in costs for their costs. That it would be um, absurd. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you, Team Loka. That's the thing. If you consider, and I know this is off the topic of uh, this is sort of on topic of off the topic of battle, of first about a glorious regime, but if you consider the battle class destroyers, there was, I think, um, let's see, HMS Barfleur, Trafalgar, St. Kitts, Armada, Sol Bay, Saint Camperdown, Finisterre, Hogue, Lagos, Scabbard, Graveline, Sleaze. Cadiz, St. James, Vigo, Agincourt, Almin, Assane, Albura, Barossa, Matapan, Corona, Orende, River Plate, Dunkirk, Jutland, St. Lucia, Belle Isle, Omden, Jutland, Nova Jutland, and um, was previously Malpa Malquet, uh, Mons, Pontecures, Nivero, San Domingo, Son, Talavera, Trim Conley, Waterloo, and Yeeps, and Vimera. They never named one after the glorious 1st of June for some reason. But if you consider the number which were built, there were 26 completed, only one lost, and yet there are zero survivors. Zero survivors. Even the Australian battle class vessels, HMS Anzac and HMS Tobruk, even they don't survive. They were sold for scrap in 1975 and 1972, respectively. So, yeah. Battle class didn't survive. Oh, I'm sure there's... There might be another book soon, but I think the next book coming out will be one of the self-published ones on, on uh, Kindle. Anyway, that is enough about 
random stuff of naval history, and on to the glorious 1st of June, and various uh, various other things. And I will, as always, put in a little note saying what's going on. Admiral Howe's Greatest Battle. Now, why do I say it was the Greatest Battle? Why? Well, in the nicest way, he took 25 ships of the line, 7 frigates, 2 fire ships, 2 cutters and a sloop, versus 26 ships of the line, 5 frigates and 2 corvettes, and for the loss of 1,200 killed and wounded, he captured 6 ships of the line, And he caused the enemy to have roughly 4,000 killed and wounded and captured a further 3,000. This was a battle which took place on the 1st of June 1794, 400 nautical miles west of Oshant in the Atlantic Ocean. It was at a time, let's be honest, of, well... Of almost endless war because this is taking place during the French Revolutionary Wars which if you look at the period wars are basically non-stop fighting at this point this is the war of the first coalition and France is at war on with four of its um, neighbors on two fronts it's fighting uh, fighting the Habsburg monarchy in Prussia in the Austrian Netherlands And it's fighting the Austrians and the Piedmontese in Italy. And it's also fighting the British because in 1793, officially, the war starts versus the British when a fort in Brest, Brittany, decided to fire upon, H fire upon HMS Childers, a brig. Which was followed by the execution of Louis the uh, 16th, at which point diplomatic ties were broken and France decided to declare war on both the British and the Dutch Republic. Let's think about that now. So you're already on war with two fr with four neighbours on two fronts and you're now adding on a third front and the whole global oceans and two more neighbours you're at war with. There are some strategic geniuses throughout history. There really are. Take care, Paul from Chicago. Paul from Chicago, he's probably right. The photos seem to show the trough got worse than a tone. Tell him I don't, don't tell him I said that. I won't tell Drac he said that. I'm sure he's not watching. And I'm sure Dan won't tell, be screen strutting and sending it to him. Uh, Drac will be at uh, will be at Tank Fest. I probably won't be, but I might well be at Chalk Valley History Fe uh, the Chalk Valley um, one because I tend to try and visit Chalk Valley each year.
I do tend to do Chalk Valley. I do. Uh, but it's going to be a case of, am I awake? <laughs> do I have the ability to get down to Chalk Valley as well? Because <laughs> if I, I don't have a car, that will be interesting. I do need to sort that one out. That's something else. I'd say that's the annoying thing of the lack of, of the thing, of them doing that, because it now makes me worry about the paycheck which I'm supposed to receive at the end of June, which is May's paycheck, which is kind of needed to make sure I have all the money, all the sort of the money I would prefer to have in place for buying a car. Because then I definitely have money spare to do things which might be necessary. Because you all know, if you, you buy a set used car, they can be very well maintained, but you sometimes need to do work on them. Which kind of is like what happens with a lot of ships here, because a lot of the ships which are captured by the British, they're perfectly serviceable ships, really. But, um, you know, the British Yards need to do a lot of work on them, because someone has beaten them up with cannon. A lot of people beat them up with cannon. It's rather terrible. Mm hmm I would like to point out that at this point, Napoleon was not running France. Um, France was being run by... Well, honestly, it's kind of weird. It's the First French Republic. And... Honestly, I'm not sure they know who's running France. Uh, when we're talking about exactly when the... Uh, the when... In 1794, when the glorious 1st of June takes place. France is technically being run by the National Convention. Um, it was... How do I put this politely? It was an interesting organisation. And honestly, the the National Convention should probably go down in history as one of the most strangely full of hope in its founding governments that quickly turned into one of the pettiest, most violent organisations ever known to mankind. Mainly thanks to a gentleman called Roshbier. And, um... Well, it's also an organisation which kind of proves the theory that revolutions are called that because they're always going around and they do tend to like to eat their own founders because basically that's what happens. Colin Cameron, um, is Chalk Valley the same week every year? Broadly speaking, usually it's around not it's usually it's around Tank Fest. So usually um, you have Tank Fest, then you have Chalk Valley, and then you have Chalk Valley. Yeah, this is right in the middle of the Reign of Terror. Do you look at yeah? His, my view on hoods uh, on Drax hood theory is that it fits the most with the information we have available, and it makes the most sense of the amount of information we have available. I would, as said, I've said before, is that you need a lot more da uh, to be able to prove any theory. You need to uh, even more data than you have, but there is certainly. <sighs> I have sat there and played Devil's Advocate for quite a while, Drac, and trying to pick holes in his argument and pick it to pieces. And it hasn't worked. It's one of our favourite hobbies. We sit there and I try and think of things, and sometimes I can be quite spurious just to see if they hold water. And that's the great thing about getting to play Devil's Advocate. You can be pretty spurious if you want to, and I can be spurious. 
And, uh, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, Greg Salsi. Danton has already got the chop at this point. They were just two months, under two months away from the Fomidian reaction, which ends with a Rogebeer and the Terror. There's lots of fun when Rogebeer gets the Terror. If anyone here doesn't know yet, Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast has a 50-part series on First Revolution, which is really good. It is. So, the War of the First Coalition, and that's far more interesting. I'm trying to think of something sensible to say about the French direct, the National Direct Convention, etc., which doesn't sound like I'm just slagging off the French for the purposes of slagging off the French. And honestly, I can't come to one, and it's like the War of the First Coalition. It is the most stupid war ever started, and I'm saying that, okay? There are wars out there which probably do rank as equivalently in the, mo in the status of being the most stupid war ever started. Um, and I am actually someone who actually considers things like the, you know, the various wars we have over pigs and cows to be quite silly, but honestly, they're over food, so I can sort of, to an extent, understand them. I, 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 I can make sense and a logic of that. The War of the First Coalition starts because people are ang uh, people just are in a pissy mood, for the nicest way. No from the nicest perspective, they are. That's what they are. You know, um, basically, for some reason, revolution and the monarchies are not necessarily that keen on revolutionaries. And when. Various points, and for some reason, Marie Antoinette's brother, I, I can't think why, wasn't very keen on the French killing her. Basically, um, there is this declaration of flints put out by the, the head of Prussia. His Majesty the Emperor and His Majesty the King of Prussia Declared together that they regard the actual situation of His Majesty the King of France as a matter of communal interest for all sovereigns of Europe. They hope that the interest will be recognised by the powers whose assistance is called in, and that they won't refuse, together with the aforementioned Majesties, the most efficacious means for enabling the French King to strengthen, in utmost liberty, the foundations of a monarchical government suiting to the rights of the sovereigns and favourable to the well-being of the French. In that case, the aforementioned Majesties are determined to act promptly, unanimously, with the forces necessary for realising the proposed and communal goal, in expectation they will give the suitable orders to their troops so they will be ready to commence activity. Now, that is pretty much a strongly worded note in diplomatic terms. And yes, it was known that William Pitt did not want war. But it's also known that If the French had probably sent, uh, the, the convention had wisely gone right then. Um, so Marie Antoinette, you can go to your brother and are banished. We will keep your children and kill your husband. That sounds rather cruel and uh, problematic, but it probably would have caused less problems than necessarily having done what they did. Uh, this is the thing. Once you start, once you start realizing that one of the reasons why monarchs tend to intermarry is it creates very strong, in terms of when they intermarry with other monarchs, very strong alliances, where you actually, where it's not the king of X country you're going to support, it's your sibling. Because let's be honest, if I was just going to support a random person who I had agreement to support, I would do everything with on, uh, within the sort of the bounds of honour to get there and be helpful. But if I don't make it, I don't make it. You know, there's a, there's a limit to what I can do. If it is my sister in trouble, then honestly, 
short of outright breaking the law, if I need to get to her, what I, I will get to her. Because she's my family. Now, once you have the Declaration of Balance, uh, the lovely French, uh, French Revolution is carried on the exact same way they'd already been carrying on. Helpfully. And so, France, eight months later, decided to declare war on Austria because they decided to declare war on Austria rather than wait for Austria to declare war on them. Which then led to... How do I put this partly? It then led to the Prussians declaring war on the French because they were allied with the Fr Austrians as of February. And in July 1792, an army of the Duke of Brunswick, composed mostly of Prussian troops, joined the Austrians along the Austrians and invaded France. They managed to capture Verdun and triggered what became known as the September Massacres in Paris. <whistles> France managed to counterattack. And when they did, they declared the French Republic. And well, then life just gets more and more interesting as time goes on. And basically, at the end of this war, you see uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, carrying all before him against uh, Sardinian, Austria, and Northern Italy uh, in the Po Valley and uh, Po Valley and. Um, Achieving the Peace of Lyon and Treaty of Campo Formio. The interesting thing about the War of First Coalition is the British are the most reluctant to join it. And in the end, they're the, ones, the last ones left fighting it. Very cool, Mr. Vanguard. Hang on, has anyone wound up dragged by saying it was an unknown sub that sank hub, uh, hub, uh, hood according to the torpedo? Scanning for the torpedoes, Prince Eugen claims to have detected. Not yet. Please, someone go for that. I prefer. Doesn't the war of the first collision basically start with paranoia and people blowing things out of proportion? Mm, well, you, you've got a part of that. Well, you know, you can. Wrongful execution, a wrongful conviction or not, in the nicest way, uh, you can convict a monarch quite easily, but actually killing them is going to cause trouble. So also the other thing is, it's rather stupid. It's a, there's a good lesson if you, the example I tend to give these days, because people tend to know it more, is um, Game of Thrones. Executing Ned Stark, losing Arya... As Tyrion puts it, they had three lives to bargain with for Jamie, which is not unnormal. Uh, Jamie Lannister being one of the characters on the side of um, one of the fa the, one of the families in Game of Thrones, and uh, well, one the one they killed and one they lost, which gave them one life now to bargain. For Jamie's. And it's always a problem when you've got... Let's be honest, but let's put it this way. When they've got a character who's more important to you than you are the characters to them. There was probably a balance in importance of Ned Stark in terms of value and Jamie Lannister between the two sides when they're both captured. 
whilst I am no doubt that the very the, the Stark family would have all would have uh, of course probably sought Jamie for um, Sansa. They would also probably be le uh, they'd probably think consider it less of a good swap. They'd want other things chucked in. Yeah, the French Revolutionary Armies were a whole new game of a new ball game of violence. How, Alexander? They were um, not really. They what they were, and the important thing about this was they didn't play by the same rules. They took the rules which had often been used elsewhere and brought them home, and this is the point with. The War of the First Coalition. It's rather a brutal war because of... And all the coalition wars. Because it's kind of people learning that... It's the period when we are starting to see the transition from... Smaller armies to larger armies thanks to logistics. And the growth of logistical capabilities and the size and the output of forces you can put together. And the French run as hot as they can for as long as they can and then collapse. Someone was trying to tell me the other day on Prince on HMS Hood that um, a 18 shell managed to penetrate three decks. I was sort of going. And a magazine. Yeah. I'm going to leave it on one side. So, the War of the First Coalition. It's. A problem, really, because the French start off badly, then they start winning, but they also have bad bits of mill, then they start winning some more. But the trouble is that to do all this winning, they have to take a lot of people out of France. And this large population shift means they somehow have a complete collapse of their grain harvest. And that's what leads to this scenario, because the French basically go to America and go, Please give us grain. We will send ships, but please give us grain. All the grain. We need it all. Americans go, How much are you willing to pay? Well, I think we can... I think we can do something. I think we can do something. And so, there is a grain convoy to be dispatched. And the British who are reading pretty much everyone's mail, because it's not at all British track record on standard policy to read people's mail, basically are going, Oh, we know how this is going to go. So, we're going to let the French... To use their money to buy the grain. Yes, that's good. Then, we, and this is the important thing, will intercept that grain on the way back. We'll stop it ever reaching France. And when the grain doesn't reach France, there'll be another revolution, and France will crush itself internally. I think people forget the Seven Years' War happened before in terms of scale. The armies and revolution are bigger, but the Seven Years' War isn't very small. No, the Seven Years' War is developing onto that path. But that's the point. The Seven Years' War is developing onto that path, but they haven't yet reached it. It's the Revolutionary Wars where they really get big.
Raccoon. And if someone puts up a good fight, they try to recruit him. Yes, that's been the British policy for a long time, and that's why Colin Cameron responded with a message. Yes, the best British army has UK Portuguese line troops, German cavalry, Gurkha riflemen, and mixed artillery, all under a tall Irish born gentleman. Um. To be fair, it worked. It did work. It worked. By the way, if you want to know why I might be looking a bit tired, because um, I have worked out that one video alone, which is going to come out on June the 6th, I have put 34 hours of recording into, roughly, including one version of it which was six and a half-ish hours long. Ah, oh, fun times. So why am I talking about Regis of Sea? Well, because it's not only the French who are suffering from problems. The British are also suffering from problems. I.e., they haven't got enough Marines. And because they haven't got enough Marines, they've actually had to call up army regiments. So, the Queen's Royal Regiment, the West Surreys, and a 29th Worcestershire Regiment of Foot are both called up. And they are deployed aboard ships. So, in the ba it's kind of an interesting thing, because... These regiments are actually fighting as marines aboard ships and are taking part in the boarding actions. And what is a real shock to some of the officers is they take part in the boarding actions and then they get a share of the prize money. And it's really kind of interesting watching these officers because these are not very prominent regiments, okay? These are not regiments which are going to attract the really expensive. These are not the guards regiments, okay? That are going to attract the really well connected. But the officers in these regiments and the NCOs and the soldiers in these regiments found that getting prize money really was valuable. And it caused a very interesting. Let me put it this way. There was very nearly a small mutiny when the army after this battle, a few weeks later, were tried to get the troops removed and tried to get them to come back to regular army units. Um, basically, they were very happy being at sea. They rather liked their prize money and they wanted to take a part in another battle under Lord Howe because they considered him very good, thank you very much. They were very happy with Lord Howe. And um, what was interesting was it couldn't technically be called a mutiny because the officers were complaining along with the men. <laughs> so basically, the entire platoon on the ships were going, no, we're not going. You know, the, 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 the captains were going, um, yeah, in nicest way, that the money I got from that prize has paid for the remainder of my life. I ain't moving. There might be more prizes. <laughs> oh. So anyway, why not catch the money? Because, honestly, that was too well escorted and went qu too quickly across the Atlantic. It's before the Western Squadron has started implementing its, bloca its blockade, really, in full strength. I told them, the British reading people's mail is a tradition for about 400 odd years. I'm not saying it might still continue, but you have to remember, Britain is the country which has laid the most undersea cables of any nation in the world. And still doing that. Many of the companies which lay undersea cables are British. Or British owned. Artillery and engineers were run by ordnance boards, so I approach the RN in terms of being more about competence than who you know. Yeah, there is a reason why for quite a, quite a few years, in when they were looking for officers to command British Army forces, they picked artillerymen and engineers because they tended to actually have the um, 
understanding of it to do it. If it doesn't, do you mean worth it? Oh, it was worth very much worth it. I'm not taking a train tomorrow morning. To um, the to the um, airport, I'm not. I've got, I've got everything booked. I've got a car coming. I get out. I get on the car in the car. The car take whisks me to the airport. I go to the airport. I get in there. I get through all the stuff, and then I do what I need to do. And that reminds me, I need to do, need to quickly check an email sent to my sister. I need to just quickly check that it was sent. Ah, oh, good. Right then, so I must make sure to save that. And save in my Australian file. Sorry, I remember, I've forgotten to save something. Sorry, it was an authentic live stream experience because what I just remembered is I forgot. I, I meant to tell, ask, um, well, I needed to, while I remembered, make sure that my sister and mum had a copy of my visa and my flight itinerary for Australia because I'd forgotten to send it to them earlier and I needed them to have a copy. But just in case they need it, you know, you should always have someone who has a copy back home. And so I'd forgotten to send it through them and I wasn't to do it while I remember because otherwise I'd forget, uh, go for a whole way through the stream, forget at the end, by the end of the stream and I wouldn't send it. So apologies. And repeatedly, oh, the Queen's Regiment is now my regiment, uh, the Prince of Wales Royal Regiment. Yes, it is. The Queen's Regiment is now the uh, Prince of Wales Royal Regiment. And the 29th Worcestershire Regiment of Foot is sort of even more interesting. And uh, when I started looking up their history and what they currently are, well, it was amalgamated, uh, it was until 1694, it was sort of, it had been raised in 1694, and it was. Under the Childers reforms, which take place in 1881, it's amalgamated into the 36th Hereford Register of Foot to become them. And then from there, they continued on to be amalgamated into various things. And now, today, it's the Mercian Regiment. So, the Mercian Regiment, who are known as the Cheshire, Worcester, Foresters, and Staffords, well, the Mercian Regiment is the closest inheritance. And so that's why, I remember correctly, both these regiments have as part of their battle honours the glorious 1st of June. Or at least they're supposed to. Because of these because of their regiment history. They are allowed to they are allowed to have that as the, part of their battle honours. Which 
Which is always a fun thing to think. Uh, let, let's put it this way. Uh, you can all, uh, the fun thing to then do is then, and what you should do with this regiment, is you go and then chart their officers, subsequent officers' careers. And the amount of officers who were involved in these battles, who, who managed to, of course, achieve sudden and very dramatic promotions because they had the years of service, they just didn't have the money to buy the next rank up. They could buy it now. Uh, could a shot could a ship armed with World one four inch guns quickly destroy a first rate at the, at the time would it require larger caliber to destroy quickly um, probably could because of the range factor especially if they're firing explosive shells so here are your commanders for the glorious first of June we have on one side Richard Howe first Earl Howe this gentleman He would die in 1799, age 73. So in 1794, he is 68 years old. And I'm going to tell you now, he's going to spend six days not sleeping on top of his ship. He's going to spend six days on an open deck, never leaving, barely sitting down. Eating only when his steward brings some food to him. Drinking only when his steward shoves some drink at him. Doing his job at 68 years old, he is going to spend six days on the deck in all the weather that comes. No going down to rest, no finding a bed or a cot to sleep in, no pampering, nothing like that. No, he is going to spend it for the next six days. On the other side, we have Villaret de Jose. Who is Louis Thomas Villers de Jose? Or Villers de Jose, depending on some time, depending on who he's writing in time. And Louis Thomas is supposed to be, it's also sometimes hyphenated as well. At this point, the French haven't executed all their admirals, but they don't really have that many. Uh, going around. This is a small problem for them. Now, Vera de Jose had served under Suffren. He had a rank of... Well, in this battle, I, he honestly has a rank of Rear Admiral. Okay, he's a Rear Admiral. That's what he is at this point. He does end up a Vice Admiral, but he is a Rear Admiral at this point. There is a debate, and you can argue about the debate, but he is he is still, at this point, a Rear Admiral. Now... His career is sort of more interesting than Tao's in terms of his randomness, but Howe's career... Well, he's fought in the War of the Austrian Succession, the Jacobite Rising of 1745, the Seven Years' War, we'll find in the American Revolutionary War, the French Revolutionary Wars, had the Knight of the Order of the Garter and large naval gold medal, uh, married uh, Mary Hartop in 1758. He had commanded in his time HMS Baltimore, HMS Triton, HMS Ripon, HMS Cornwall, HMS Glory, HMS Dolphin, HMS Dunkirk, HMS Magnamy, HMS Princess Amelia, the Mediterranean Fleet, the North American Station, and was at this point in charge of the Channel Fleet. This is one very, very experienced naval officer. He'd first gone to sea in 1740. So at this point, think about it. It's 1794. He's been at sea for 54 years of his life. Or serving in the Navy for 54 years of his life. He has spent a large chunk of that at sea. I tried doing the sums. I came to roughly 50 or 51-ish years of that his life had been at sea out of 54. This man knows the waves. In contrast, his counterpart... 
Well, he officially joined the French Navy in 1778, and he would serve till 1797. He would die in 1812 in Venice, age 65, but he was born in May 1747. So, you can think that. He officially joins the French Navy, officially joins the French Navy when he's 31 years old. By the time we're talking about 1794, he has been serving in the French Navy for... roughly... hang on, that's 12... 16 years? 16 years. He was... Joined the Navy as a volunteer in 1768. He is promoted to acting lieutenant in 1773. And it's not until sort of 1778 that he joins the Navy proper after the Governor de Belvoir-Crom support agrees to it during the siege of Pondicherry. So yeah, he's had a bit longer service at sea than his figures will not necessarily give him. But he hasn't had as much. And whilst he did fight in the American Revolutionary War at the scenes of Pondicherry in the Battle of Cuddle the Door, in the French Revolutionary Wars at the not only the glorious 1st of June, but the Crosse de Grand River and the First Battle of Gras, and he served in the Parliament Wars at the Saint Dominique expedition and the invasion of Martinique, he is not as experienced. Let's be honest, for starters, in 1794, he is 47 years old to house 68. This man has 21 years on him. And those are 21 hard fought years. So, anyway, in the age of sail, were full admirals and ministers in rear and vice admirals actually fighting the battles? Not in the Royal Navy. This guy was a full admiral. He was fighting the battle. And even to this day, full admirals tend to be in overall massive command. Basically, you're talking... No, honestly, it's never been a scenario where there have been admirals, because of your seniority, you've been a ministra administrator. Um, as a rule, the admirals find a way to pass the administration on to someone else. Usually slow when someone lower down the food chain, who can't argue with it. Andy Pidor, the Naval Crown subscribed 1st of June 1794. Battle on the Queens. Yeah. And it's, it's worthwhile thinking about that. The regiments... Who, trust me, uh, there are... I think there's one regiment who has their entire regimental silver was captured in a naval battle. They took... The, basically, the uh, they fought so well at the battle, they were supplied troops and they were t key in taking one of the flagships. And basically, the um, British Admiral turned around and said, Does your regiment have regimental silver for your dinners? No. You see all that silver plate from the French, I think, it was, no, it was the Spanish Admiral, from that Spanish Admiral's ship. Yes, that's your regimental silver now. Enjoy it. And that's, the, that. I think that, I think they, there is a, one of the modern regiments still maintains that silver as their regimental silver for their very big fancy dinners. Because it comes all the way back from that. <laughs> No, there are very, there are, let's put this one away. The Royal Navy couldn't have picked a more experienced pair of hands to put this fleet in, uh, in hands of. Yeah. Yes, Alex Hunt, cousins are watching.
We all dream of having juniors we can pass off admin to. I'm currently working out whether ship sh if Shipshape does well enough whether we can create an academic internship. Not being rude, but <laughs> just to pass off my admin to. <laughs> uh. I don't know. Well, that's, that's, it's better than nicking Napoleon's brother's chain pot, Vittorio, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. So you have a balance, but you also have another different uh, with them. Because there is the command structure, and I'll want to quickly talk about the command structure. The command structure is. Um, how do I put this politely? The command structure is interesting. Because for the French, they have, well, they have Rear Admiral Bouvet, Rear Admiral Villiers Jose, and they have the Rear Guard, which is, and I know some people like to, dis uh, dis uh, to debate this, Rear Admiral Nile. Okay? Let's put it this way. There are people who want to dispute this, and before we get into the order of battle, I'll point this out to you. If in your rear guard formation, you're not sure who's in charge, well, let me give you a clue. If it's a formation full of third rates, and there is a single first rate, and on that first rate is a rear admiral, then the odds are the guy in charge of the rear guard is the first rate and the rear admiral. That's the, you know, that's the possibility. Makuch, which of the React academic internship, which of the fluffy researchers are my favourite to get the job? There's a whole competition now. We have to be careful with which one we select. Amra House Brothers and Army General. Yes, he was. And so, the French have three rear admirals. That's all their senior officers. Let me look at Howe's list. How? has Rear Admiral Thomas Pasley. Mm -hmm. Vice Admiral Thomas Graves. I'll put that over here, actually. Rear Admiral Benjamin Caldwell. Rear Admiral George Boyer. Of course himself, Admiral Lord Howe. Uh, Rear Admiral Alan Gardner. Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Hood. Um, so basically four rear admirals, two vice admirals, and a full admiral are what the Royal Navy has. So you have commanders who have a lot more experience, and then they have a lot more experience to draw from them. Because let's be honest, if anything happens to Villa de Jose, who takes charge? It's one of the other two rear admirals, but there's going to be an argument over that one. Whereas if anything happens to Howe, there are two vice admirals, of which probably Hood takes charge, because let's be honest, Hood is Hood. And as good and as hard working as Thomas Graves is, Hood is probably going to win that argument. And then on the other side, you then have four rear admirals. You have more rear admirals in the Royal Navy formation than you do have in the French. The French have more ships. But the Royal Navy have more rear admirals there. So, you know, you have a more distributed command network, a greater pool of experience, a greater pool of officers to react to events who will react and draw their ships forward. You also have the problem that for the French, there is the fact that this gentleman, Paul Villers de Jose, is not alone. Because he has with him the representation, uh, represent on mission, Jean Bon Saint André. Now, Jean, Pont, uh, Jean Bon Saint André is a French politician. Um, he is president of the National Convention from the 11th of July, 1793 to the 25th of July, 1793. 
So he'd done his two weeks as that. He was in the National Convention from the 5th of September 1792 to the 26th of October 1795. Um, well, he really didn't have unnecessarily the... Um, How to put it politely, the but always the best time in life. But he did contribute quite a lot of things. He's one of the people who I think um, came up with the stripes, the vertical stripes of the front, national front, uh, flag of France, the uh, red, white, and blue. And he was noted for showing moderation in regard to the reign, uh, the contrast directors of the reign of terror. But. He was kind of lucky in that he was appointed consul in Algiers and the Samira and was then prisoner in the Ottoman Empire for three years. And Napoleon made him match a legion de honor in 1804 and baron the empire in 1809. So, you know, he'd done well. Uh, but he died in 1813, and that's another interesting thing. A lot of the French just didn't live that long. Even the ones who managed to not get killed by artificial means in the Revolutionary Wars, quite a lot of them die young. This hood does survive the battle. It's Alexander Hood. My coach, Hood versus Grace. There will be an argument, surely. Who has seniority? I do. Okay, your order, sir. Um, that should theoretically be the argument, the point made, but Hood has a habit of just taking over. And Grace has a habit of really letting him get away with it. Because as eager as Graves is to command, he's also quite happy to let Hood do what Hood does. And whilst Hood will follow Howe, he won't necessarily follow Graves. Even the plates the Englishman, the Englishman eat off, courtesy of Supply de France. Well, honestly, there is another continuation of the story I was telling you earlier about, you know, the regiment which got it. Part of the story I do remember is that... Uh, when when it was remarked later how generous the admiral had been, um, uh, his flat gaps equipped well uh, equipped well we already have three dinner sets we couldn't before we didn't have space for a fourth. <laughs> um, you sort of get you know you, there, there is that jo there is that joke going around but actually it was also a bit of a it was a reward certainly for things well done and animals could uh, can usually in terms of plates etc and those sort of sets animals can normally do with them what they want so they can take them up and sell them, or they can, you know, give them out to the crew, or they can, in this case, reward a worthy regiment. Yeah, every navy which has had a political commissar along has always done so well. So, now we have what should be sort of considered the seventeen uh, the Atlantic Campaign of 1794. The fact is, this is what ends in June in 1794, but it starts off on the 2nd of May, 1794. It starts off in the che Chesapeake. Which is always in a sort of interesting place to be. The con French convoy departed for American waters on 2nd April. British convoys departed from Portsmouth on the 2nd of May. And Howe covered those convoys out as far as the western approaches. And on the 5th of May, dispatches HMS Latona and HMS Phaeton 
close in to the breast to ascertain the status of the French. It was them, those vessels, which reported that, uh, that Villiers' battle fleet, the, the Jesuit battle fleet, was still in harbour. I'm not going to see my house from there. Cool. Now, in the Atlantic at this point, while this is going on, there are detached squadrons under a French Admiral, Neely, and a British Admiral, Montague. Now, Montague was a pretty good Admiral, but he was not as senior as Howe. But his squadron is important, because one of the things that happens later, is, of course, is he goes back, doesn't actually manage to meet up with Howe, and I'll, that's a revealing bit of history, but it's not really a spoiler alert. And he's the squadron which is coming out, which basically for, uh, which causes the French grain convoy to go, you know what, we're going into Atlantic ports, not the Channel ones. Because we can't risk fighting that squadron. Now, Neely, the French admiral out the scouting for British convoys, managed to encounter the Newfoundland convoy and took 10 ships as prizes, including the convoy's own escort, the frigate, a 32 gun frigate, HMS Netcaster. Now, Neely was out with quite a large squadron. And Thomas Trowbridge, the captain of the caster, would therefore get to spend the entire campaign aboard Neely's flagship, the Sans Perel. And actually, we have some surviving written testimony from him. He's kind of an interesting officer, and he does, of course, go on to become a rear admiral. And he dies in 1807. And served in eighteen, but he took part in things like um, the Battle of Cape St Vincent and all sorts of things. He had a lot of experience. Unfortunately, he is lost when his um, flagship, the Blenheim, is found uh, found in a cyclone, and while he's sort of, I think he was heading for the Cape of Good Hope. But he was off the coast of Madagascar when it found it and was lost. Now, Trowbridge. Actually, there are some papers and surviving documents which tell us what the war battle was like from his perspective as a prisoner aboard the Sans Perel. So it's an interesting one to go look up. I'm very sad to hear that, Ruhon, that the Iron Brew supply trucks have yet to arrive. Now, the thing is, Neely has the success, but then Montague has his own success, because Montague starts capturing these ships back. Woohoo! And by the way, when they capture a ship back, and they capture it back with its cargo... That means the Navy, in well, they don't get, of course, the prize money, but they get the insurance money. Because the owner is now getting the vessel with their ship back. So the insurance company gives the Navy a bounty. Thank you very much, and the Navy would go. Mainly that was because of stopped the Royal Navy selling them off as prizes. So it was very quickly realised by the insurers they had to give the Navy something, or they would be buying it from the Navy at auction, and the Navy would do things to drive up that price. Because they were quite happy to drive up public auction prices. It was in favour of crews that public uh, ships which were put up for public auction went for as high a value as possible. So ensuring that you had a suitably attired friend in the auction, occasionally adding in an extra bid, was, you know, not beyond the wit of... Any naval officer. Now. Montague actually managed to capture, as well as some merchant ships, recapture merchant ships, managed to capture the French corvette, the Marigutin. And thanks to her found out accurate intelligence on the direction and size of the French grain convoy, which he immediately sent to Howe. Nearly resumed his patrol in the Mid-Atlantic, and 
and he actually managed to meet the convoy in the eastern land, uh, meet the convoy from America a few days later, and decided to reinforce the convoy commander Vanstable's escort with two of his own ships. He then pushed ahead of the convoy to look for British activity, which might for, uh, for, uh, pose a threat to its passage. And he dispatched frigates to Villa de Jose, carrying information and um, asking, uh, you know, for basically for him to come out and escort the convoy. Howe, in contrast to Neely and Montague, has been just cruising his ships back and forth across the Bay of Biscay. It's aim being to either catch the French fleet or and the French convoy, or to make sure he was able to spot any spot, uh, ships coming from Montague. It was between. It was roughly around about the 18th of May that he returned to the Bre Brest and found that the French battle fleet had gone. Taking advantage of dense fog. He'd sailed. Villaret de Jose had sailed. And managed to pass so close to the British fleet that actually in the fog that both sides heard each other and just thought they were other ships of their own group. The French Admiral's Villaret de Jose, the French Admiral, was of course completely, uh, how do I put this, informed by Nielet's action. And his plan was to meet up both of Neely and the convoy, combine forces, and using the overwhelming numbers to bring the convoy safely to the desired ports in France. Now, during this transit, Villeray gain, gains a great success. He runs across a Dutch convoy with 53 vessels. Its escorts, the Alliance and the Waxa... Wakazamahed? Wakazamahed? Uh, Wakazamahed? I'm never going to pronounce that one right. Just basically went, hang on, there's no way we can beat an entire battle fleet. And left. And the convoy scattered, and so the French scattered, captured 20 merchant vessels. How? Had to quickly worked out where Ville de, de Jose was probably going, and so was pursuing him. And his plan was that he had to get to Montague first. Now, why did he have to get to Montague first? Because, as we all know, the Royal Navy has a habit of executing admirals who don't fight. And Montague doesn't have enough ships. Montague really doesn't have enough ships. If we consider what he has going around at this point, and I'll be talking about it in a bit, but uh, Montague's squadron at this point is made up of eight third-rate 74s, a 64, a 32, and a 36. Now, I would say that's a fairly good squadron. But it also is not a squadron I want to fight a um, fleet the size of Villa de Jose. Especially not a fleet the size of Villa de Jose uh, combined with. Um, well, uh, combined with uh, Neely's and uh, Neely's fleet. Anyway, they pursue, and thanks to the French keep capturing ships, and the British keep capturing the ship, the captured ships, and therefore learning information from them, Hal basically follows this breadcrumb trail of captured ships to the uh, to the French squadron. It's brilliant. They, you know, it's a great thing. The French are completely being let down by their own desire to capture ships. Their own not paying attention to their own instructions. It happens. On the morning of the 25th of May, 
Howe had spotted a lone French ship of the line at 0400 hours. This ship spotted Howe at the same time and immediately made off in the direction of the French fleet. Now, what's really cool is this ship of the line left behind an American merchant ship that she had been towing. When they captured, or rather when they caught up with this American vessel, they found out the French ship they just chased off was Audacious of nearly squadron. And, well, how being how went, I'm not going to let this fall into anyone else's hands, so he burnt the prize. And then, so the British fleet then went as fast as they could, overran and burnt two French corvettes they found on the way, the 20-gun Republican and 60-gun Incun, and managed to continue the chase for the next three days, with Audacious leading leading the Royal Navy straight to the French fleet. It's very helpful, then. Very, very helpful. Now, it was the morning of the 28th of May. The morning of the 28th of May. And Howe was still on his deck already. Remember, he will be on his deck for six days. He doesn't go down to the early hours of the 2nd of June. And he has been up on station from about the 27th of May. He hasn't gone to bed. He's got a chair made up on his, his deck. Which he can sit in when he needs to rest. It's his view. But it is commented that he hardly ever seems to repose in it. And keeps actually putting others in it. Who he feels are looking more tired than himself. Including at some point some young midshipmen who are looking particularly peaky. Okay, when I get back I have to get a new ring light. I keep reminding myself. Please, when I get back, remind me, order a ring light. Now, how spots them and confirms them at 0630 hours. Then he recalls his frigates because he doesn't want them getting caught by the enemy fleet. And tries to press all sail in, a, in to hopes of basically smashing into the rear of the scattered French line before they'd actually formed up. By 1035 hours... His own line has basically, uh, how do I put this politely, has dissipated. And Villeray has the weather gauge, and Howe is sure that he will use this to try and outrun him and escape. So, Howe calls up Admiral Thomas pa Rear Admiral Thomas Paisley. Now, Thomas Paisley is an interesting person. He is a really interesting person because if you look at the other admirals in the Royal Navy Squadron, if you look at them and what they're commanding from, every one of them is on a second rate. There is even a second rate wandering around without a rear admiral on. That is called HMS Glory. It's running around, doesn't have a rear admiral on board. You find that Thomas Palsley is aboard HMS Bellafron, a third rate, a 74 as quick and as swift as they come. Why? Because he's a speed merchant. If you wanted someone to take out from the past and put in charge of a battle cruiser squadron who'd actually win, you would take Thomas Parsley. You really would. And basically, Hal gives his orders and says, you take the fastest ships we have, you and command a flying squadron, and chase them down. This squadron were not only significantly faster than the rest of the British ships, but were significantly faster than the French. And so they did. Well, no. I've had a ring light for a while because you all kept complaining a while back about my, um, how weird I looked. So I have a ring light which 
focuses on a white thing, but it's not working. So I've had one for ages. They're not that expensive. And it's not the biggest ring light. And let's be honest, it also serves to hold my camera, this stand, uh, on my phone when I'm doing 60 second videos, when I'm recording shorts. So any time you see a sort of me recording something yeah, where I'm obviously hands free, the reason is because I'm using this as a rule. even came with me to help with hot tubs but it stopped working now now they managed to catch up the French and it's HMS Russell commanded by Captain John Willett Payne which fires the first shots at 1430 hours In an attempt to hold off the squadron that's racing up to them, the first rate, 110 gun, Revolutionaire, dropped back, letting the smaller third rates of the rear of the line go past it, and then started engaging the pursuing British van. This manoeuvre was conducted without orders from Admiral Joseph Villiers, and Captain Vangrel of the Revolutionaire was... Not really popular at the end, but at least he was popular and he, he managed, it was doing it to attack the enemy. Bellafron, which was one of the cl slowest um, ships in the British van, but still one of the fastest ships in the fleet overall, managed to succeed through a quick, quick tack to bring the Revolutionaire into a steady action 1800 hours. They exchanged fire for 20 minutes, but the Pelafron's a third rate, and Revolutionary is a first rate. So she is taking severe damage to her rigging, and so she's then replaced by HMS Marlborough, under Captain George Cranfield Berkeley. Marlborough is then joined by HMS Russell and HMS Fundra. And they have plenty of fun shooting away the Revolutionary's rigging, so that by 1930 hours she's basically unmanageable. And then HMS Leviathan joins the action, you see the point here? Alright. But basically the British, how the British are defeating a first rate? Just keep piling in the third rates. Now at this point, the French were trying to tack around and Howe was concerned that Paul's fleet was being, going to be cut off from the main body of his fleet. So he recalled them at 20 hundred hours. However, HMS Audacious had only just managed to reach there, and this was under the command of Captain William Parker. Now, Parker is, of course, the gentleman who goes on to have all sorts of interesting issues. He is the... Well, he is the person who severely resented that Nelson was given the credit and uh, appreciation that he was. And he was very upset when Nelson was given an independent command of Mediterranean whilst Parker was on blockade duty off Cadiz. And so he would end his career, his career in North America at Halifax, Nova Scotia, but would be recalled for disobeying orders. It's always fun when you have that happen to him. Anyway, Parker decides he knows better than how. And so he continues engaging Revolutionaire so closely that she could not safely withdraw. And she basically dismasted the Revolutionaire. And Audacious takes severe damage, of course, as well. It was until 2200 hours that Audacious and Revolutionaire disentangled themselves and limped off. And the phrase limped off is used by several authors for a very good reason. They have both shot themselves to pieces. Now, here is the interesting thing. Audacious's crew, including Parker, later claim that Revolutionaire had struck a colours during the engagement. 
Parker stated he did not take possession of the Revolutionnaire because he was concerned by the distant sighting of nine of the uh, French ve nine French vessels of the squadron under Commodore Jean Joseph Castier to the um, south on the horizon. Now, the reality is this. If, in the nicest way, Parker is eager enough for honour, prestige, and he's already ignored Howe's orders, I have no doubt that if he thought that ship had actually surrendered, he would have taken it. He would have landed a sentence on Grohoboard. He would have gone for it. It's a first rate. You go for it. Interesting enough that the ships under Commodore Jean Joseph Castilla do not join the battle. They go off because they can't join the battle because that's not in their orders. It's not in their orders. Do I have a last iron brew in here? And so they go off. And they're no longer part of the battle. And, well, Revolutioner gets back to the, the French fleet and Audacious gets back to the British fleet. And whilst Audacious crew made efforts to try and repair their ship and rejoin the rest of the, uh, the Hal's force, um, in the morning they find themselves only half a mile from their former opponent. And Revolutionaire was suffering far more severely. Now, it's very close that... Um, it came very close for, actually, HMS Fundra to come up and take possession. But she didn't. Despite being ordered to by... She misread the signal. And so, Villarreal managed to get revolutionary uh, re reinforcements to Revolutionaire. And H uh, the Audacious also came up to support her, and along the frigate Balone and two corvettes. And so HMS Audacious, which is the British one, then there's Audacious, us, there's Audacious, which is the French vessel, which is A U D A C I E U X, and A U D A C I O U S of the British, then came under fire again from Revolutionaire. And so she withdrew from the superior force. She gets chased off by the frigate and the two corvettes and eventually loses them in a rain school and returns to Plymouth on the 3rd of June. Revolutionaire has to be taken under tow by Audacious and that brings her safely into port into Rochefort several days later. And Revolutionaire, because of the captain, because he let... Uh, that's what it's like. The French captain, who was held at the British, stopped their pursuit, catching the main fleet that day, done all that heroic stuff. He arrives in port and he's arrested because he left before the main battle. Hi, Jack Ray. I just mean. Now. On the 28th of May, with Audacious and Revolutionaire lost in the dark behind behind them, the British and French fleets just basically continued westwards towards the convoy rendezvous. At dawn on 20th of May, the British saw Audacious retiring to east, but did not follow. They decided to focus on the main fleet. How? Ordered his ships to pursue the enemy rear. Again. This time, at the front, is Captain Anthony Molly in HMS Caesar. And by the way, this video could also be entitled How Captain Molly Almost Got Himself Executed by How at Point Blank Range. Now... Molloy definitely wasn't... An ally, you know, a, 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 a ally actist, uh, dies cast kind of commander. In fact, honestly, you would have to say he is an officer who doesn't really understand 
what his ship was for. And I say this coming from a, a, a warm and understanding place. But he doesn't. Because... Molle refused to close with the enemy. In fact, him and HMS McQueen opened fire on the rearmost French ships from a distance instead of closing. And the vans of the opposing fleets then just fired long range broadside duel from 10 hundred hours, which inflicted just mild damage on both sides. And the worst vessel hit was the uh, French vessel of Montanard. At which point, of course, they failed to cut the French line. But how is she reissues the disorder of Mole to attack in close line at 12.30. Once more, Caesar's supposed to lead the way, you know, Captain Mole. The idea is to use to break the French line and split the enemy fleet in half. Now, he then refused to, to carry out the order and signalled without cause that Caesar was unable to attack and then managed to turn and sail eastwards down the outside of the British fleet rather than towards the enemy. This kind of threw the rest of the ships into a state of confusion. Queen, HMS Queen, uh, attempted to obey House Signal alone, but was badly damaged. And a Captain John Hutt, mortally wounded. As she was unable by this point to effectively efficiently manoeuvre, Queen passed down the outside of the French line, firing as she went. So how responds the only way a 68-year-old man can? He decides to lead by example. An HMS Queen Charlotte is pointed, his flagship is pointed straight to the French line. Steers around the of the HMS Caesar, possibly shouting some abuse over the loud hailer, and aimed to break through between the French 6th and 7th ships from the rear. Was unable to reach this gap and said sail between the 5th and 6th ships from the rear, raking the Eol, which was the 6th ship, from close range. At this point, HMS Bellafron. And you have to remember, HMS Bellafron, who does that have on board? Oh, yes, it has our good friend from yesterday's battle, Rear Admiral Thomas Paisley aboard. And HMS Leviathan under Lord Hugh Seymour, who is his next ship in line of his division, try and make this difference. And try and decide they're going to support Lord Howe. Because, let me put it this way. Imagine you were the Rear Admiral who went home to Britain and went, you know what, Lord Howe charged the French fleet alone because HMS Caesar wasn't going... Oh yeah, and what did you do? Well, we just sat there and watched him and thought how brave he was. While he got killed. Yes. Die. So, um, instead, what happens is... Rear Admiral Parsley turns around to um, his flag captain and goes... Follow. Yes, sir. And that's what they do. They manage to get close behind the Queen Charlotte. And they managed to cut through the subsequent French ships. Bellafron managed this successfully. Uh, Leviathan, that's the other the ship following her, is prevented by damage to her stern. But this manoeuvre managed to break up the battle. As it allowed how ships to... Uh, as um, how ships managed to isolate and then rake the terrible, the tyrannicide, the indomptable. Forcing Villa de Jose to either choose between either abandoning the ships or sacrificing whoever gauge to save them. Eventually, HMS Orion, HMS Invincible and HMS Barfleur cut through the French line as well. And Villa de Jose wore his fleet around to face how. Now, Villa de Jose had taken Caesar's disobedience and weirdness for 
meaning that the British fleets didn't have any heart and were weakened. Oh, don't get me started on Caesar, because um, there is going to be some fun with Caesar. Oh, thank you, Jack Ray. Um, Villaray basically turns his whole fleet around and tries to isolate um, the Queen Charlotte, the Bella von Leviathan, and they're forced to retreat because the main French force is now heading towards them. And then uh, Villaray de Jose reforms his fleet and attempts to escape westwards, followed by the British. The British, of course, are now holding weather gauge. And this is important because the fleet which holds weather gauge gets to decide when and where the battle takes place. Both fleets were too damaged to continue action in the remaining daylight, and firing stopped at about 1700 hours. And it's during the night that Admiral Neely arrives. And Admiral Neely brings ships with him to reinforce the, uh, the, uh, the Villa de Gise. And so... This is, they're getting ready for the Battle of the 1st of June. However, it's important to note that on uh, that day, the British frig uh, HMS Castor, which had been captured earlier in the campaign by Neely, was attacked and retaken by HMS Carisfort, another frigate, under Captain Flantus Lefore, uh, for whom, of course, the Lefore class will, uh, assume, uh, will someday be named. And that's the frigate action of 29th of May, 1794. Um... They found that some of the crew were still aboard, but they found also that most were still ta had been taken aboard near this flagship, the Sans Peral. Now, on the morning of the 30th of May, Hal sends a signal out to all his captains. All these captains get sent the same signal. Asked if they could sh consider their ships ready for combat. Does anyone guess which is the only ship? Only one ship! Which responds, it is not ready for combat. Anyone want to guess which is the only ship which says, No, sir, I am not ready for combat. Longbow. Uh, well, you're answering that one. I, uh, answering that one. I will ask the question, answer Longbow's questions. Question. When they relay communications, do they use communication picker ships? They do. They tend to have frigates sitting back from the line of battle and they will pass things on. Seems to be, you, you very quickly seem to be guessing this. Yes. <laughs> Caesar, Caesar, yeah. Yeah. The only ship which responded with, I am not ready for combat, was HMS Caesar. Now remember, he has HMS Caesar has already Molly has managed to get. Um, if you look down here, you'll notice HMS Queen, which was behind him on the previous day, had a rear has a rear admiral in charge. That was a rear admiral who didn't like having flag captains, and uh, that was Rear Admiral Alan Gardner. Now. He but he had a flag captain aboard HMS Queen before the, uh, that battle. But because of the decision taken by Caesar, which meant instead of supporting Caesar, he crashed in alone to the French fleet. Um, his flag captain was killed. That kind of annoyed him. So there is now one admiral who wants to probably do nasty things to him because he keeps mucking up his plans. And there is one admiral who he's got his, friends, his friend killed. So... Anyone else at this point will be thinking, my career's days are numbered. I had better be doing my best, jo uh, my best job. But no, Captain Anthony Minoloy of HMS Caesar was continuing to be a little bit silly. And considering he's in charge of an 80-gun third rate, he shouldn't have been being silly. Seriously, HMS Orion is in every battle. St. Vincent Trafalgar, 1st June, and now Battle of Groy. The French must know they have been trouble when she shows up. 
Yeah, she's certainly an interesting vessel. Orion does have a history of interesting, an interesting name of service in the Royal Navy. So, this is the fleet. This is what Howe has to command. And please note, Lord Howe has a fleet of three first rates, four second rates, 18 third rates, seven frigates, a sloop, two cutters, two fire ships, and a hospital ship. In addition, Rear Admiral Montague is somewhere sailing around not far away with nine third rates and two frigates were, you know, da -da. there's also Captain Rayner escorting a convoy with two third rates, four, a fourth rate, and three frigates and a sloop. It's fun. Why was he not executed at that point? I think the reason he was not executed at that point was Lord Howe honestly didn't know who he could replace him with, with all the losses that were being taken. And also, in the nicest way, he didn't have time to do the actual set of the court. But no, this does, let's be honest, this does read like, a, look at these admirals and look at these officers. Because what I would like you to think about is the sheer quantity of experience you have going on here. You have Thomas Palsley, you have Lord Hugh Seymour, you have John Willett Payne, you have Thomas Graves, you have George Cranfield Berkeley, you have Captain James Gambier, you have Benjamin Caldwell, who's got as his flag captain, George Blagden Westcott. There's also Captain Henry Nichols there under the, Thomas Graves. As HMS Barflor, which is commanded by Rear Admiral George Boyer and Captain Cuthbert Collingwood. Yes, a Collingwood is here. There's Captain James Piggott here. There's Captain Thomas Packenham, Isaac Scomberg, Thomas McKenzie. Lord Howell's ship has Captain Sir Roger Curtis and Captain Sir Andrew Snake Douglas. A young potential future wizard who unfortunately gets killed at the night of a battle. And then he's, you've got Captain John Harvey, who when he dies aboard HMS Brunswick, Lieutenant William e Edward Crackhaft takes command. Then HMS Valiant under Captain Thomas, uh, J uh, Thomas Pringle. Then HMS Orion under Captain John Thomas Duckworth. You've got Rear Admiral G Alan Gardner, who's being his own flag captain. His flag captain's died, and he's, beside, he's running the ship himself. You've got Captain Henry Harvey. Of HMS Ramillies. You've got Captain John Baisley of HMS Alfred. You've got Captain James Montague of HMS Montague who dies in the battle. You've got Vice Admiral Alexander Hood. Where? Captain John Elphinstone. Captain Charles Cotton. Even the frigate captains are frigating dangerous. The point I'm trying to make is, Howe has been sent with a fleet of very good ships. More importantly, look at the sheer amount of experience he's got to command them. There are the Harveys and Montagues involved in this battle are related, and that does feature as part of the battle later on. In fact, at one point, one of the brothers basically goes hunting for a battle, fighting his way to find his, other bro his brother because he thinks something's gone wrong with him. He's convinced something's happened to him. He actually is. His brother's been mortally wounded. And he fights his way through and relieves his ship. And, you know, that's a kind of an interesting battle. An interesting thing to think about in the battle. In that, yeah. One of the brothers fights their way through. To literally find their brother. Um, it's Captain Henry Harvey who hunts through on HMS Ramleys to find HMS Brunswick. And he basically hunts through the battle, uh, trying to find his, bro oh, his brother's ship because he just has a feeling something's happened to him. And when I say he fight hunts through the battle, he doesn't avoid fighting. He fights his way through the battle to get to his brother. It's basically he turns HMS Ramleys into a one-ship vengeance motif through the French fleet trying to get to where his brother ship's besieged by three French ships fighting away 
and blasts his way through. They save his brother's ship. They capture a couple of ships. And there is a debate as to whether he manages to get on board in time to see his brother before he dies. Um, some accounts say he does. Some accounts say he doesn't. And I'm inclined to believe the ones that say he doesn't. But I would... It would so it so it is definitely isn't the Hollywood ending because the Hollywood ending would of course would be him getting to the ship just in time to check uh, say, with his wish his brother is best or something like that. But this is the entire battle we're going to be talking about is an entire this whole th battle could be a movie. There are just so many things going on in this one. Very good, Rohan. Rohan, I kill you, but it's too much paperwork and I don't have the time. Pretty much, that's the only thing that's saving Captain Molly at what, several points. That is the only thing that's saving him. Um... Now, in contrast, in contrast, well, you have a bit of an interesting scenario going on. Because the French, as I've said before, there is a debate amongst some as to whether or not Nearly is in charge of the rear guard. Again, he's the only rear admiral there, and he's aboard a first rate. He's in charge. Um, there is the convoy I mentioned earlier, which had nine ships of the line wandering around. There is, uh, which, there are various debates as to where, where exactly it should, should have been at this point, where it was supposed to be heading. Uh, there is Villa de Jose, uh, which is three first rates, 23 third rates, five frigates, and a brig corvette, and a corvette. And the bad was is also Rear Admiral Varsville, who had two third rates, two frigates, and a brig, and had escort a convoy. Rear Admiral Cornet, with a single first rate, seven third rates, two frigates, a corvette, and a cutter. There are also four more frigates and two corvettes on other duties. And there's a Commodore and nine other ships somewhere sailing around. So the French have a lot of ships wandering around, but in this actual battle, they have the Convention, the Gasparin, the America, third rates. And if you look down, you go third rate, third rate, third rate, third rate, third rate, third rate, first rate, the third rate of 80 guns, uh, first rate, third rate, third rate. So they have some 80 gun third rates, and they have three first rates, and they have roughly... I think it's 480 gun third rates. Which contrasts the British, which are 74 heavy. They have Caesar, Gibraltar, though, which are their 80 gun third rates. And they also have four second rates. So they have four second rates, two 80 gun third rates, and 18 third rate, 18, seven, uh, and, well, 16. 74 third rates and three first rates so it's fairly even in force structure in many regards technically the French have one ship superiority but let's be honest their one ship superiority mostly comes from their number of 74s the British have the same number of first rates so they cancel each other out they have four second rates, which have more guns. They have two 80-gun third rates to the French four 80-gun third rates. But there again, you have four second rates. So that means that's kind of six to four, cancelling it out in terms of any advantages in numbers. And the rest are all sort of 74s and even. So basically, the French have not enough guns. Not enough guns indeed. But you will notice there is an HMS Northumberland there. 
which is um, captured by had been captured by the French previously and is captured in this battle. She is kind of the focus of quite a lot of work to capture her because the British are not happy with an H of Northumberland being part of the French fleet. I can't think why. Um, yeah. And this is also, of course, the battle where the Royal Navy gets the name Sans Perel from. It's nice to know where that name comes from in the Royal Navy. So this Caesar didn't have a Tory as all shots of it. No, this Caesar did not. And this from H. Vernon. Does anyone else notice that all the admirals on the World War II King George V have been being really, really aggressive, as do Hood, Nelson, Rodney? Yeah, it's almost as if the Royal Navy's trying to make a point to anyone around the world. Now, the French fleet, the trouble for them is you have a lot of lacking in experience. And you notice that some ships I haven't listed their captains because we're honestly not quite sure who's in charge. Because there has been such a changeover. Some of these captains were not only lieutenants not that long ago, they were some of them were even junior. It's a worrying formation. And this is how the fleets line up. You can see the British, you can see what's the target, you can also see which ships break through. You can see Queen Charlotte and Brunswick, they try and break through. You can see Marlborough and Defence, they break through. You can see Royal George, you can see Glory breaks through. Now, of course, Brunswick is Captain John Harvey's ship. The captain who dies and whose brother chases after him Ram uh, Ramleys. And basically, as you can, I'll get into his story, but he breaks through behind Queen Charlotte. He does his best to keep up with Queen Charlotte. It's his job to look after the Lord, the Lord Admiral that day and he will do it. But you also notice something else. HMS Caesar, supposed to be leading the line. Right behind, behind right in front of HMS Bellafron. Probably because if HMS Queen had been there again, there is odds on that Admiral Garner would have actually used his guns to make, make Caesar actually have something to worry about. Now, at 0500 hours, Villeray, who had not been, uh, did you say, had not been idle during the night, uh, was trying to put distance between himself and Howe's fleet. And was try it was only a few hours probably away from actually potentially succeeding this. But Hal was doing his best to make sure there wasn't adv was an advantage. Hal, in contrast, was uh, making sure his men were having breakfast. And using the weather gauge to close the Villaray. And by 08-12 hours, the Royal Navy was just four miles from the French. Now... Howe had formed a theoretical line of battle at this point, and he had frigates acting as repeaters for the Admiral uh, for his commands to guarantee that no one could miss signals. C 
Caesar is at front again. In the front again. Now. Whilst it is to an extent normal for fleets to pass one another, firing at long ranges and wearing in slowly, slowly accruing damage on the enemy fleet until they start to break and then giving chase and capturing them. Hal didn't like that. Hal decided to take advantage of his captain's greater experience, of his crew's greater professionalism, and of the fact he hasn't been killing off NCOs and officers rapidly here, there and everywhere. And this is despite being sorely, sorely tempted by Captain Malloy, let's be honest. That the man in charge of HMS Caesar is someone who is tempting him on a regular basis. Um, he decides to attack the French line directly. But in, unlike the previous counters, where he was deciding that the, where they were going to attack in a line, and uh, where and they, where the the ship one of the ships had formed a line to pass through the enemy ship and the enemy line, how ordered each of his ships to turn individually towards the French line, intending to breach it at every point. And with the aim of raking the French ships at both bow and stern, allowing the RN to p then pull them on the leeward side of their opposite numbers and cut them off from their retreat downward, engaging them directly and forcing them all to surrender. Because you see, if you can hit a ship at the front, see, that's what I say. You hit a ship side on, right? Broadside. You can hit many targets. Boom, boom, boom. But there's a lot of open space. There's a lot of stuff which, if you hit, is not going to cause much damage. Whereas if you're hitting a ship from head-on here, oh, you cause a lot of damage because there's this is a very condensed space. Bow on, hull is quite condensed. This way, there is space. It's less dense. This way, it's very dense. You fire into there, you're guaranteed to hit something, probably painfully. You fire into this, you might miss something. Now, guess what happens? As soon as he issues the signal and turns HMS Queen Charlotte, some of the British captains misunderstood the signal, some possibly ignored it, and some hung back in the original line. Some would claim they were still struggling with damage from Hal's early engagements, and cannot get into action fast enough. This means you end up with what can best be described as a ragged spear, headed by Queen Charlotte and to an extent by Bellafron. However, please notice, there are some interesting ships which don't move that quickly. One of them is HMS Royal Sovereign under Vice Admiral Thomas Graves. You will notice She's not got a line over her. But you will notice also that HMS Royal George. Yes, Royal George. First rate, 100 gun, Vice Admiral Alexander Hood is one of the ships which charges straight off, going after the Sans Perel and the Republic. They will take them both down. It's Royal George. All those in favour of another ship being called HMS Royal George because of Prince George, say eh? Anyway. And now we sort of divide the battle up into what happens at the van, the front part of the force, and then the, uh, the main centre, and then the rear, okay? So you can keep sort of try and track on them. So we're going to talk about the van first of all. Queen Charlotte's not, despite her trying to lead the rag of the attack, she was not the first to actually through the enemy line. That was HMS Defence under Captain James Gambier. Yes. 
and one of the Van Squadron under command of Admiral Graves. Notoriously dour, by uh, you know, in his uh, phraseology, is Ga James Gambia, but that she, the Air Defence, the seventh ship of the British Line, successfully cut the French between its sixth and seventh ships, the Mutius and the Tourville, raked both opponents, and then found herself alone fighting the enemy. But. Instead of surrendering, instead of going trying to run away, she decides to just take it on by fighting every single French ship in turn. So that's what she does. She, begi uh, she begins firing at every single French ship which passes her in turn. Luckily, she's very quickly supported by other ships. Uh, HMS Marlborough manages to break through not long after her. And then other vessels start to come up. And HMS Balafron and Leviathan, still suffering the effects from their previous events, uh, didn't not didn't breach the enemy line, but they pulled along the near side of Eole and America and brought them to close gunnery jewels. So whilst they didn't break the line, what they did was they went up this side of Eole and America and engaged them. So, hang on, don't know. So if you look at this at the Earl in America, America, basically HMS Bellafront and HMS Leviathan, because of the damage they received in the previous battle, they charge up and they fight them there. They just they don't break the line, but they're still engaging the enemy. Um, Thomas Palsley on Bellafron actually lost an egg a leg in the uh, in the opening exchanges and is forced from the deck at a certain points HMS Royal Sovereign Admiral Graves' flagship uh, had a bit of a miscalculation and she ended up pulling up too far from the French line and coming under heavy fire from the Terrabal it took time for her to engage with Terrabal more closely she suffered a severe pounding and Admiral Graves himself was badly wounded However, it was HMS Russell and HMS Caesar which annoyed him at the, uh, annoyed him most. Russell, his captain, John Willett Payne, failed to get to grips the enemy more closely and allowed his opponent, the Temeraire, to badly damage her ringing in the early stages. But this could also be partly due to damage sustained on 20th of May, in 29th of May for a poor start to the action. However, Captain Anthony Molly, well, totally failed, is the phrase used in some descriptions. Uh, in others, it was he was accused of, accused of point-blank cowardice. He completely ignores, at best, House Signal. Continued ahead as if the British battle line was just following him, and um, just carried a sort of long range out of fire with the Trajan to little effect. In fact, Trajan managed to damage Reza's rigging and was actually able to then turn around and attack Bellafron and basically wandered around the battle being unchecked at the head of the line. Without Caesar doing anything. So Caesar basically left Trajan this shit to do on its own. So whereas Bellafron and Leviathan, which couldn't do anything more than they were doing because of the damage, manages to um, get uh, at least hold their enemy off, Caesar doesn't even do that. Caesar is basically... Might as well not be there. Basically. In the centre... The Royal Navy force was divided into two. The forward division, under the command of Benjamin Caldwell and George Boyer, and the rear division, under Lord Howe. Unfortunately, Caldwell and Boyer were less active than Howe. Um, they, instead of moving directly to impose, impose them, they, they sort of went a sedate approach to the French in line ahead formation. The grouping together as a group. 
and it was eventually only HMS Invincible under Thomas Pakenham, which ranged close to the French lines. Um, in fact, they kept up such a long range, a long distance duel with the Air French that they didn't actually give any support to defence or anything like that. Invincible is badly damaged by her basically lone charge where she leaves the rest of her ships apart, but she managed to engage the Juiced. The Juiced, of course, being a very interesting 80-gun uh, third-rate ship. And then HMS Barfleur, under Boyer, enters the action. But this is after Boyer himself has lost a leg in the early opening exchanges. So, basically... Boyer gets injured, Palsy's injured, there are two two of the air, rear admirals have already been injured by cannon fire. In contrast, Queen Charlotte decides she's going to sail, sail, sail straight for the Montague. Okay? And that's the French flagship. She passes between the Montague and the Venger de Purple. She managed to rake both. Hold up close to Montague and engage in a close-range artillery battle. Uh, during this time, she has a brief entanglement and a brief fight with Jacobin. Uh, and manages to damage her too. Uh, basically, she manages to set both French ships she's on fighting this point on fire. And then Brunswick joins up with her. Now, Brunswick had initially had some issues because she come behind the flagship... And Captain John Harvey actually did receive a rebuke from Hal for delaying. Harvey did not like being rebuked. And so he pushed his ship far or forward fast. In fact, almost beat Queen Charlotte to the line. And he blocked her view of the eastern half of the French fleet for a while. And managed to take severe damage from the French fire as she did so. Harvey... Hope was aiming to uh, run abroad, uh, run aboard Jacobin, and actually support his admiral directly. He was very loyal to Howe, and there is a debate of whether Howe's rebuke was well. Some people said Howe's rebuke was basically being cr was you know telling them off, but the thing is they knew each other quite well, so in a, a pot potentially it was to an extent a bit of ribbing. In that house going, ah, oh, yeah, you know, age before beauty, that sort of thing. The style of ribbing in the time. And, well, yeah, Brun uh, Harvey wasn't going to allow that. But, sadly, he was not fast enough to reach her. And so, instead, attempted to cut between Achille and Venger de Purple. Which failed when her anchors became entangled, when Bunzik's anchors, that is, became entangled in Venger's rigging. Harvey's master, the ship's sailing master, then asks if Venger should be cut loose. And Harvey replies, No, we've got her and we will keep her. <laughs> Please note, again, the Venger de Purple is a 74-gun ship of the line. Saying the words, we've got her, so we will keep her, is not exactly what I would consider normal phraseology, but it's the complete opposite approach to Captain Malloy here. And... The two ships managed to swing so close together that Brunswick's crew, as they couldn't open their gun ports, Fired through their gun ports. Let me rephrase that so you understand. The gun ports are closed. So what they do is they ram the cannon up as hard at the gun port as they can. And fire the gun. So the cannon blasts out through the gun port. Through the cover. They shatter their gun port covers. In order to be able to engage the enemy ship. Because they're so close, they can't open the gun ports against the enemy ship's hull. Behind this formation, behind Hal, HMS Valiant under Tom Springle uh, managed to get close to Patriot, which then pulled away. 
Um, her crew were officially suffering from a contagion and so unable to take their ship into the battle. So Valiant turned and, and attacked Achille, which was already raked by Queen Charlotte Brunswick and so badly damaged. And then, basically, what interesting about Valiant is that she blasts away at Achille and causes damage to her, but then she notices the van division is in trouble, and so she presses on to help the van. HMS Orion, under uh, John Thomas Duckworth, and HMS Queen, under Admiral Gardner, uh, both decided to attack the same ship. Um... But both ships bore down on HMS Nor uh, on the former HMS Northumberland, which they dismasted and left attempting to escape with only a stump of a mast left. Queen um, decided to f uh, then go and attack Jemma Paz and started beating her up, and Orion went on to beat up other ships. But basically, um, they seem to have decided, HMS Queen and HMS um, Orion seem to have decided that there was not going to be a French ship named Northumberland. <laughs> and then you have the rear. Right. Of the British rear ships, there are only two which are classified as making a really strong effort to break the French line. Unsurprisingly, Royal George pierced the line between Republican and Sans Perel, the current and former flagship of Rear Admiral Neely, and decided to engage both closely. Glory came through the line behind Sans Perel and decided to throw herself into that little melee as well. The rest of the British, French, and rear guard don't really participate in this close little fight. Basically, um, how do I put this? Republic, George, uh, Royal George, uh, Glory, and Sans Perel decide they're going to have their own little battle and ignore everyone else. No one else wants to get involved in it. They are having fun, okay? They are having fun. No one else wants to get involved in it for a while. And, um, well... Uh, HMS Montague decides to fight a long-range gunnery duel with Neptune, with neither damaging each other at all, really. Uh, Captain, the, to be fair, though, Captain James Montague was killed in the opening exchanges, and so the command devolved down to Lieutenant Ross Donnelly, who was pretty darn new and trying his best. So I'll give him a bit of... I will give a lieutenant who's taking command of a ship a bit of a leeway. Um, Captain Henry Harvey in HMS Ramleys, pretty much, as you can see, he is the seventh vessel from the back. So theoretically, theoretically, he should be engaging on Trumpment. But he fired at her and she ran away. So he decided to ignore her. And acting on instinct where he knew something was up with his brother, he charged headfirst to where... Um, Queen Charlotte and Brunswick were fighting their battle in the central line. Sans Perra, yeah, yeah, to an extent. Um... Uh, let's see, HMS Alfred, um, what did she do? Well, she exchanged the, engaged the French line extreme range, and then HMS Majestic did likewise, until action was decided when he then took the surrender of several already shattered French ships. Basically, HMS Majestic went around the ships going, I will take your surrender. I'm in all fine condition. Um... HMS Fundra, under Alma Alberti, managed to ignore the initial action completely. And this was despite she was flying her, uh, the signal for a close engagement from her own mainmast. On Trapman and in Pedalier were um, also rather idle and basically, as said, were keeping well away. And the Scipion, the French rear ship, 
Um, try to avoid becoming the action before eventually, uh, without, due to its own sailing inadequacies, managing to find itself deeply in the group of uh, the, uh, the battle going on about the, around the Royal Georgian Republican. And um, that was not a good place to be. There are basically two vicious, nasty fights going on at this point. They are around the Queen, Queen Charlotte and the Royal George. And you do not want to be caught in either of those fights. And if you get caught in those fights, you're going to be in trouble. And that's what happens to a few ships. Him, yes, and he is closer to the correct pronunciation for the French. Yes, because the French pronounce it sans pari. And the British pronounce it sans parel. Uh, it was over an hour later, an hour later into the fight, that HMS Caesar actually attempted to join the fight. And she did this, and she had a vital spar shot away by Trajan, which caused her to slip down the two fleets without actually contributing to the battle at all. Um, she might as well not be there. Bellafron and Leviathan were... Well, at this point, Bellafron was fighting something like 3 to 1 and taking serious damage to her rigging, but was... Um, actually smashing her opponents to such a point that uh, the, the French captains were sending for messages to ask people to withdraw them. Eventually, the British actually also signal, and um, HMS Latona, the frigate, under Captain Edward Formborough, Arrives to provide assistance. Uh, he brings his ship between the uh, uh, ships of the French battle line, opens fire in the oil, uh, drives off, helps to drive off the three ships of the line, and that will now and that will be surrounding Bellafron, and tows Bellafron to safety. Leviathan, under Lord Hugh Seymour, um, had managed to dismast America, and this is despite El and Trajan also firing at her. And she only left America after a two-hour duel, sailing 11.50 hours to uh, join Queen Charlotte in the centre, because everyone's looking back and going, um, Lord Howe appears to be surrounded by the French, and is... Okay, uh, right, someone go pull Lord Howe out of that. He's not supposed to be doing that, or that, or that, or that. Um, there was vague rumours... In this battle, there are the interesting discussions of how many exact boarding actions are attempted by various people. Now, the Russell hadn't broken the French line, and the Temeraire, the French vessel, was really getting the better of her, knocking out a top mast and escaping to win with the Trajan Earl. Russell then fired on passing French ships before joining Leviathan in attacking the centre of the French line. Russell's boats also took the surrender of America. Her crew were the, one, the, vessel, uh, the sailors which boarded the vessel to make her a prize, although they would later be replaced by men from the Royal Sovereign. Admiral Graves dies at this point. And Terrible, which she'd been fight, which the Royal Sovereign had been fighting, fell out of line to windward and joined the collection of French ships forming a new line on the far side of the action. Villa de Jose had managed to withdraw his own flagship to this line, um, having escaped Queen Charlotte. And so it was uh, Montagne, uh, which uh, Royal Sovereign engaged next, pursuing her pretty close to the new French line accompanied by HMS Valiant and beginning a long range action with the French line behind the Royal Sovereign Marlborough was still entangled with Imperus uh, badly damaged Imperus was on the verge of surrender um, she got some uh, Imper and then she got some brief reprieve when uh, Musius appeared through the smoke and collided with both ships the three entangled ships continued exchanging fire, with several Royal Navy officers trying to figure out of whether or not they can do it for a multiple boarding action. 
And um, at this point, heavy casualties on Marlborough, but Improduce has lost all three masts. And then Marlborough is forced to retire. Below, well, the captain of Marlborough, Captain Berkeley, is forced to retire below, with serious wounds. And Lieutenant John Monckton takes charge. Now, Lieutenant John Monckton will go on to become a rear admiral. He signaled for help from the frigates in reserve. And HMS Aquilian, the uh, frigate under Robert Spence of uh, uh, Stopford, uh, came up to assist and tow the Marlborough out of line. As Musilius was freed herself and managed to withdraw for the regrouped French fleet to north. Impetuce is, again, too damaged to remove at all. And so sailors from HMS Russell in their boats come sailing up on border and go, You are now a British prize! And they have to deal with that. That's basically what HMS Russell's big contribution to this battle is. She's going around sailing and getting prizes. HMS Defence by this point was dismasted and unable to hold any of her four or five opponents she'd had at various points to a, project, uh, uh, to a protected duel. And so by 1300 hours was threatened by the Republican, which was moving to east. The Republican was hauled off to join Villa in North. Gambia, however, of defence, requested support for his ship from the, uh, from the frigates. And it was HMS Phaeton under Captain William Becknick, which came. As Impetus passed, she had actually fired on Phaeton. And Baton resp and Becknick responded with several broadsides of his own actually outgunning in Petus. And then Invincible, which was the only ship of the British divi forward divi only ship of the four division of the British Centre to engage the enemy closely, became embroiled itself in the area around Queen Charlotte. Again, Queen the area around Queen Charlotte is a frankly a nightmare. But Invincible's guns drive juiced onto the broadside of Queen Charlotte. Where they keep blasting her and also blast through doors again, which allow, allow them to force surrender, to uh, uh, force the Juice to surrender. So basically, Juice is captured between Invincible on one side and Queen Charlotte on the other. So she has an angry 68-year-old man going, Give me my sword I wish to board on one side of her. And on the other side, she has a ship which looks like it's just survived going through seven, seven layers of dragon wars. Uh, you know, with, I don't know, Lord of, uh, not Lord of the Rings Star Dragons? Yeah, I'll go for Lord... Well, no, let's go for Game of Thrones Star Dragons. And, um... Basically, getting blasted by both of them. So decides it's about time to surrender. <sighs> HMS Impregnable had lost several hover yards. And um, it was only thanks to um, Lieutenant Robert Otway and Mitchum and Charles Dashwood that she was actually able to move around at all. Because they managed to do some work to fix her. Now, at certain points, it was found, it was felt by especially a certain admiral that the, conf the battle between the Queen Charlotte and Montaigne had been one-sided. The French flagship hadn't opened up, used her lower deck guns at all. And, um, well, that, by the way, is Lord Howe, and that's the injured ship that were people around him. During this battle, people keep getting injured all around him. Some by British fire, which was long-range fire being aimed in the general direction of the battle and actually hitting the British ships. But it was so those officers can say we were firing into the battle. Uh, captain Molly was a very experienced captain. I, I don't think we can put it down to um, how do I put this? Uh, I I I I. I I don't think we can really put that uh, the problems with Caesar down to Molly not knowing his job. I really don't think so. I think so. Um, uh, 
actually at one point they get fired out of one of the this bit this painting perhaps he shows when HMS Gibraltar, which was under command of Thomas Mackenzie, um, had failed to close the enemy and was so instead firing at random into the smoke surrounding HMS Charlotte, Queen Charlotte, and actually were hitting HMS Queen Charlotte. Um, and during this battle, uh, this uh, engage, Captain Sir Andrew Snape Douglas was seriously wounded. After the French flagship, the Montana, escapes, which you already had heard about a bit earlier, um, of course, uh, Queen Charlotte, at this point, how it goes, Queen Charlotte suffered enough, we should withdraw. <laughs> no, he doesn't. At this point, uh, with Montaigne got away, Queen Charlotte decides that she's going to engage with Jacobin and Republican, because they're passing her. And so, they were annoying. And then she goes and takes on Just, of course, and helps in forcing her surrender. And then... She notices that Brunswick and Venger the Purple are in a bitter, bitter conflict. And locked together, firing buoyant sides, as I've said, from point-blank range through their own gun ports. Captain Harvey Brunswick, by this point, has been mortally wounded. Um, he has been mortally wounded by... Well, yeah. He has been mortally wounded by what's called Langridge fire. Now, Langridge are when you put... You run out of shot sometimes, but sometimes when you're just short of shot, you put bags of junk, that's scrap metal, bolts, rocks, gravel, old musket balls, and you fire them at a ship. And it's this, this kind of shotgun cannon fire which has been uh, used to mortally wound the uh, Captain Harvey. However, his brother is charging in there. Now, at one point, the Brunswick is not only engaging the Avenger de Popel, but they also have the Achille come try and come attack, intervene. And the Brunswick responded by dismasting the Achille in the exchange and forcing her to, at some one point, surrender. They decided to rescind the surrender when they realised that Brunswick was in no position to send a boat to take her surrender. And so they rehoisted their colours and uh, made an attempt to join Villaray. It was not until 12.45 hours that Venger and Brunswick pulled apart, dismasted and battered. And it was only after Ramilly, uh, Ramillies came up, and Ramillies is what managed to se secure Brunswick and help her back. And it was Ramillies which took Venger's surrender. because it, Although they tried to not to, but they gave her a carronade. Um, and then, then Ramillies went and hunted down the Achille and took her surrender as well. To the east, this, the Orion and HMS Queen um, forced the surrender of both Northumberland and the Jumma Paps. Uh, HMS Queen was unable to secure Jumma Paps and she had to be abandoned later, sadly enough. But they had managed to get their prizes. Queen was pretty much uh, unable to make the British lines again, wallowing between the what was now a reforming French line and the British battle line, along with several other shattered and severely twisted and burnt and crushed off ships. HMS Raw, George and Glory had managed to not only disable Scipion and Sans Peri... Well, Sans Peri is the French call it, Sans Perel is the British call it, um, but were also to damage themselves to take possession. And all four ships were also amongst those along with Queen, which were sort of floating in centre between the fleets. Now, at 11.30 hours, Villaro de Jose tries to um, um, recover his losses. And so he decides to aim his formed up squadron at HMS Queen. Unfortunately for him, Howard spotted what he was planning 
He reformed a squadron consisting of Queen Charlotte, Royal Sovereign, Valiant Lefarfen, Barfleur, and Thunderer. That's not a good set of names to be have a squadron formed that name. And then he deployed the squadron in the Fencer Queen. And these two lines actually engaged each other for a distance before Villa de Jose abandoned his maneuver and hauled off to collect his own dismasted ships before the British could take them prisoner. Um, the Terrible managed to uh, batter, very battered Terrible managed to sail through the British line to actually reach the French at this point. And he recovered the dismasted Scipion, Musius, Jamaps, and Republican. Before the British and the unengaged British ships could have actually reached them and demanded their surrender. And it's only at this point that Howe thinks the battle sort of won. And he sort of goes, right then. Um, he does come back to deck, but he goes to disappoint. He does something which he's probably wanting to do for a while. He goes and goes to Lou in peace. Let's be honest. The man's been awake for nearly six days at this point. He will be awake for six days. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't gone below for anything. I'd say if you're 68 years old, if you want to go and have a bit of peace while you do your... Uh, your, do your ablutions. I think you probably designed it after this point. Now. The British, by this point, only have 11 ships still capable of battle to the French 12. And let's be honest, if we go back to here, whilst you have a nice strong fleet of rear Admiral Montagues, force of nine, rate, nine third rates and two frigates sailing around somewhere, you actually are more likely for the French to bump into one of their fleets wandering around, because they have slightly more wandering all over the place. Mm -hmm. They broke the French line. And so this is not the first time in a battle someone's gone to break the French line. Or break the enemy line. It's been part of naval battle for quite a while at this point. But the point is, this is the first time someone's tried to do it the way by the HAL method, where all your ships turn and go in. It must be an odd occurrence that was recorded. Admiral Hunter. Pretty much n the reason it's noted is because it's noted that when the Admiral went down, but it's also noted that he came back on deck. And then he is eventually persuaded to go down again. And there is a big debate over... The reason this sort of stuff is known is because it's felt by some that Sir Roger Curtis, his flag captain, um, takes charge in the sort of organising the battle at this point. And um, he doesn't, he, he's accused of dissuading Howe from attempting further pursuit and uh, for not capturing more of the dismantled French ships. And um, mostly, this, this is, these people that are arguing for this are people who are not at the battle. In fact, the vast majority of people who are arguing these things are those people who are not at the battle. Those people who are at battle are sitting there looking at going, well, we know who we blame, it's not Curtis. In fact, the vast majority of people who are trying to blame Curtis and trying to attract Howe's and talk about what Howe's attentions are and what he's doing are people who, after the battle, are trying to defend Molloy. Now... The British crews were also the ones that were trying to make repairs and secure their prizes they secured seven in total but as i mentioned earlier i only mentioned six why because one blows up the venger de purple which was incredibly badly damaged it'd been holed in many places by brunswick and after a surrender no british ship had managed to really get men aboard this meant that her survival was dependent on venger's remaining unwounded crew 
Unfortunately, a vast majority of them had managed to break into the spirit room and become drunk. And as we all know, drunk people do not make the best carpenters. They really don't. Especially not when it's drunk and combined with salt water coming in. Now, ultimately the ship's pumps became un un unmanageable and she began to sink. And it was only boats from HMS Alfred and HMS Culloden and the cutter HMS Rattler which managed to save Venger's crew from drowning. These sh three ships taking off 500 sailors between them. Uh, by 1815 hours, she was beyond salvage. And they basically only what was considered the most wounded who couldn't be moved, the dead, and the drunk who were, couldn't be moved, will remain aboard. In fact, several sailors were waving in the treacle from the bow of the ship and cried, Vive la nation, vive la republic, as she went down. Now... The British went home at 0500 hours on the 2nd of June. The French had gone home almost straight after the battle. There is only, actually, what is interesting about this battle though is we do have one ship which does have some results because the Scipion records were made, uh, were, um, records are pretty good, whereas the rest of the French captains, a lot of their losses at times are sort of incomplete and a mess. And the accounts that we have sort of some British officers aboard ships. But the fact is we don't have a lot of details. So when I give you these figures, these are very much approximate figures. But we we mostly consider the French lost somewhere in the region of 7,000, including 3,000 captured. And the British casualties, which are easier to confirm because British records are obsessive in so many ways, although there are some discrepancies, uh, generally given to be around 1,200. Basically, they got the drunks who were willing to come with them off. They didn't get the drunk. The drunks who weren't willing to come with them didn't get off. Um, should I be worried by the fact that my supposed charger, portable charger, has only reached 7%? And I've been charging it all day. And I have a feeling it's not working. Oh well. Right then. So. When Audacious arrived in British... HMS, that's HMS Audacious arrived in Portsmouth. They, the uh, Royal Navy knew the ba that the battle had taken, was taking place. And so that's why they dispatched Admiral Montague. His force of ten ships are intended to cover Howe's withdrawal from Biscay and also find and attack the French grain convoy. Now, Montague managed to find and chase the Connick, who was another French admiral's squadron, into Berthune Bay. He blockaded the French squadron overnight. But on next day, he sighted Villers de Jusé's fleet coming and decided that he wasn't getting caught between de Jusé's and Connick's fleet and sailed south to avoid becoming trapped between the two forces. This meant Villers and Connick gave chase and went south. This benefited Howe because it meant his fleet, when they passed where the, the they, you know, he, where the issue had begun for Montague, there was no French there. But it also meant that there were many, many British ships sailing around the area. And so, the convoy arrives in the Atlantic ports, and they make for the Atlantic ports. Now, the legacy is kind of different in Britain and France. 
In France, it's considered a Villa de Jose. It's promoted to Vice Admiral. They take part in a celebratory parade from Brest to Paris, accompanying what was viable of the recently arrived food supplies, but a lot of it spoils en route. And the fact is, as much as the French were shouting about it, French Navy had just suffered its worst loss in a single day since the Battle of La Hogue in 1692. And that was a problem for them. In Britain, Howe refused any further elevation. And but his political opponents decided to dissuade Howe from uh, the King George the Third from making him and uh, Howe a knight of the garter. Graves was elevated to a peerage in Ireland as Baron Graves. Hood was made Vis Viscount Bridport. And Boyer, Garner, Palsy, and Curtis. Curtis was of course promoted from Captain on the 4th of July, 1794, and we're all now rear were all made baronets. Boyer and Parsley received pensions of a £1,000 a year to compensate for them for their severe wounds. Think about that. Your wounds are so bad that in 1794, you, you get £1,000 a year. All first lieutenants were promoted to commander, and our officers were promoting consequence of their actions. And a memorial to Captain jo uh, Captains John Hutt and John Harvey had died, uh, died of their wounds was ra raised in Westminster Abbey and you can see that to this day. Now. There were, of course, some people who were really, really annoyed they weren't given better awards. Um, and they weren't given more medals. There were several captains who excluded from the list and felt they should have received better awards. In fact, some of them you can understand because Cuthbert Collingwood, flag captain de Barfleur, which had me involved in quite a lot of fighting, Refused all awards for future services until he received the glorious 1st of June medal. He received it after the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1797. So two years later. And, yeah, the battle was eventually recognised as one of the... Uh, ba uh, one of the battles which could get a class attached to the Naval General Service Medal. But this was five decades later. Awarded on uh, awarded on upon application of all British participants still living in 1847. Now, apparently, the most terrible thing of all, though, was what happened to Anthony Molly, who it was ba he basically he would describe it as a whispering campaign. Some others would describe it as a whispering campaign. Most of the Royal Navy described it as "We're calling you a coward to your face and behind your back, but we're telling it to your face." He um. He requested for an official court martial to clear his name, and um, he was dismissed from his ship. With well, the Royal Navy officially saying they did not question his personal courage, but they did prefer, they did call into question his professional ability, which was pretty darn tough of them. Honestly, it was perfectly correct. It was perfectly correct, but uh, it was pretty darn tough on them. Now, he had, prior to Caesar, commanded HMS Thundra, Trident, Intrepid, uh, Carnatic, Fortitude, Bombay Castle, which was a third rate, and Ganges, which was a third rate. Um, Fortitude, which was a third rate. You know, he had a lot of experience in charge of ships, or being on ships.
Now, he demanded a court-martial, and it was the first not going to be given to him, and then later on it was given to him. It was convened aboard HMS Glory in Portsmouth in 1795, charged with failure to cross the enemy's lines in business to signal the Admiral, and that he not used his utmost endeavours to close and with and defeat the enemy. The prosecution was Sir Roger Curtis, of course, who had been Howe's flag captain and who was now a rear admiral. Uh, Molloy, I tried to argue, the ship had been thrown into confusion after a ball had struck the stern beam and left her unmanageable. However, unfortunately for him, uh, there is these things called ship's carpenters and various other sources. And... They, the court finds that the charges are found to be improved, but they also decide that, frankly, um, it was better if he left the service quietly to call to stop further trouble, rather than another execution. So um, they officially, as I said, find that his courage is unimpeachable, but. He's dismissed from his ship. Excuse me a second. Someone just walked past my window. What the frigate is my sister doing now? Darren? Yeah? Just checking with you. Ay, caramba. Sisters. Sisters. They're fun things. Yeah, and never gets another command. I would argue that um, he's kind of helped by the fact that he marries one of the daughters of Admiral Sir John Lafory. So, you know. I emailed it to you. Ages ago. Yeah. Yes. I do love it. I'm live and having a conversation with you, but yeah, she just warned us up. Uh, right. um, I, I, which may or may not have helped sort of support him. Um, interestingly enough, in terms of him and um, his connections to people, well, his future son-in-law is a guy called Sir John Beresford. Hmm. And they have a son together called George Beresford. Always fun when you have all these connections. Yeah, the nighttime gardener is out and about. Anyway, so that's the battle for you. That is the glorious 1st of June. You can decide how glorious you think it was. Live sister base interruption. Yes, you always know it's live. It's, you always know these videos are live because of sister. dearly. I do. I love her dearly. Sisters. Excuse me a second. Admiral Charles Beresford's ancestors. I think that is the family that eventually... They are connected with that family, yes. So basically, politics means that they can't do anything. It's, it's better for the Navy if they don't do what they could have done to him. She wasn't trying to lift anything.
she was not trying to lift anything. It would be harsh, it, honestly, it would be harsh on BT because there are many things you can argue against BT that he was stupid, etc., and all these things, but he was never a coward. There are many things you can argue about BT. Um, Corvettes were pretty much basically used as escorts, as um, basically they're, they're, they're small frigates, they're, they're the French version of brigs to an extent. They tend to be slightly thinner, slightly longer than a brig. So a brig you could consider a slightly more is made for maneuverability as a corvette is made for speed. Thing is, political connections instead of his personal ones. Yeah, you could argue that. His political connections are certainly useful. Right. Okay, so. No, 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 so Melo is a post-turtle, someone who's placed somewhere and no one know why or what he's doing, but everyone can see that he didn't get there on his own. He, he, he had promised possibly beforehand. But there are a lot of interesting things which come, a, come in up after the battle because of the debate over it. That's another reason why I call it the sort of the Jutland of the Age of Sail, because it's a disputed battle. And I think I... yeah. Sorry, I'm just... I, I've had my... I got a new portable charger today uh, uh, from Amazon, and it's been on charge all day, and it's got the seven percent. So I don't think it's working. I don't think so. The agent, I dislike Malloy. I despise Beresford. Now you tell me they're related. Yeah. By marriage, mainly. I, I'm not sure whether George Beresford is his father or his uncle. And the fact is, Mary, who's Malloy's daughter, dies after her first child. But yeah, the Royal Navy, the, the Navy of this period, well, most of these navies in this period are incredibly incestuous. In that they are... Again, it's going to sound strange, but there's not really much option for them not to be. Because... Who do you meet? Who do you marry? You, uh, you know, who are you going to have your connections with? Who are you going to socialise with? And so this leads to these, these sort of things. Run. Turns out the bad are in animals are genetic tra traits. <laughs> uh, coming up, send it back. Oh yeah, it's going to be sent back. Uh, I don't think I'll get foldable solar panels. I think I probably will end up having to pick something up in duty free tomorrow. Yay! Your iron brew has arrived. Night Tigger <laughs> is the British Empire's whole thing in regards to Belgium's neutrality still a whole thing now, even after the Empire dissolved? Or did that go the British Empire when it dissolved? No, it's still a thing because it's a British thing. It's not well, it wasn't a British Empire thing, it's a British thing. Yeah, I think they are related to the general as well. Um, of the prizes, it's well to note that, that um, the Sans Perel, um, which was commissioned in 82, is not broken up until 1842, and Juiced uh, was only decommissioned in 1802, but was a popular command until the decommissioning, after the Peace of Amans. 
Um, the 470 gunship, uh, 70 gun, four gun prizes. Akira and Northumberland were broken up as unserviceable as soon as they arrived in Britain, but the crew still got prize money for them. And, um... America... Well, Impetus was destroyed in a dockyard file. Dockyard fire in 1794 while undergoing repairs. And America was first taken into the Royal Navy as HMS America, but then rena renamed HMS Impetus in July 1795 and remained in service until 1813. The combined prize money... Combined prize money for these ships was roughly 200 f and uh, well 201,000 pounds now <sighs> um let's see Let's. Uh, I'm, I've gone to. I've quickly found. Um, except recommended cookies. Yes. Uh, Two hundred one thousand pounds in seventeen ninety four. What, according to the Bank of England, in the inflation calculator, would that equal today? Let's see. That's equivalent to today to the twenty to a twenty one million five hundred sixty eight thousand six hundred ninety eight pounds twenty. And I missed off ninety six pounds. Let me add in the ninety six and let's see what it works out at. Six. Yeah. Twenty one uh, twenty one million five hundred seventy eight thousand nine hundred ninety nine pounds and sixty six pence. As of March and twenty twenty three. It was never the British Empire which guaranteed neutral Belgium neutrality, it was Britain. I will be tweeting on the trip. Don't worry. Yeah. The corner of lottery rollover. Uh, let's go back to this. And let's see if I can find... So, if we work it out, and we do sort of work this one out, um, if you consider the UK's the average national sal the average salary in the UK is f the median salary is listed as according to the office of, uh, uh, the office of national statistics is listed as 38,600 uh, 600 pounds for full time so if you divide 21 million by that uh, let me just do my maths. 
get my Excel spreadsheet up. I have got that here. I was just sort of doing this figure in my head, and then I went, hang on, that's too big for me to do in my head. It's always fun when you realize your maths is just, it's good, but it's not good enough for that. Uh, basically, that's the average salary of 544 people. And let's be honest, the average salary in 2023, average income. was probably uh, not that much. The average income in 1794 is listed at, a family income is listed at three pounds. So if you again go into the, the, the 200,000, that equals 200... Uh, 201,096 divided by 3. Um, that's the equivalent of roughly 67,000 years of work for the average person. One eighth to flag officers, two eighths to captains. Yeah, you work down. But that's still going to be a lot of money. Prize money wasn't taxed. Oh, and you must... Yeah, prize money. How many ships could the UK have built for that? Um, for the 200,000? That probably is cheaper than buying the ships. New. But also, you have to remember, it's not just, it's not just the money, it's the wood supplies. So let's be honest, you use these French ships, you're using the French wood. You're using the French um, supports, you're using the French this and that, you know, that it takes, it saves a lot of effort. So, with that much further ado, I'm going to say, as uh, that's now showing all this, I'm going to tell you that tomorrow evening, while I am flying, you will be watching, if you're watching on my channel, you'll be watching the first, or, well, hang on, no, is it the last or is it the first? Let me just check. You'll be watching. Da, 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 da. Key Ship Series 2, Ship 8. And tomorrow's video is Tillman's Maximum Battleships. Then we have the glorious 1st of June, uh, the Jutland of the Age of Sail, the Long Patrol on Saturday. Then we have HMS Cossack as Key Ship Series 3, Ship 1 on, H on Sunday. There's a premiere for that. And that will be live at 7 o'clock UK time. Goodness knows when I'll be live. Because I might do a live on Sunday, I might not. Anyway. As I said, thank you very much everyone. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for making Australia possible. And thank you for everything. And I hope you enjoy the videos I prepared for you in a month. There are, I kid you not, there are 30-ish videos sitting there. I think there might be more than 30 sitting there. Um, I have got videos recorded for you up to the 10th of July. 
that are sitting recorded. Um, there is not a single gap before the 5th of July. And, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Cooch. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Runon. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, Dan Freeman. See you soon, Dan Freeman, because you'll be joining me in a couple of days' time. Uh, thank you, Duke and Petrin. Thank you, Blackburn Maximus. Thank you, Michael Phillips. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, Steve Clark. Thank you, HMS for Dunn. Thank you, Darius Rosatsky. Thank you, Alves Alsaski. Thank you, Duke and Thank you, David Goulding. Thank you, History Vanguard. Thank you, Nice to Say Everyone. Thank you, everyone who's been watching this evening. I hope you've had a good time. Um, I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you, Bijron. Thank you, Colin Cameron. Thank you, everyone who's been here. Karma Gersberg, Mark Harkness, all of you. And I will be message you as we're on our way and as we're wandering around. Um, there are going to be some details put up on the, on the system and I'll be putting up adverts on Twitter, etc. where we are. But again, I want to give a real shout out to the lovely people at the Queensland Maritime Museum. We are there. Uh, da, 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 that one. We are there, as I think I said earlier, on the um, 13th and 14th. The 13th, it's not open to the public. They are opening up the museum just for us to wander around. This is how nice these people are. Tuesdays are normally their day off. They are coming in to show us around their museum and let us go through everything. And then on the 13th, on the 14th, um, on the Wednesday, we are giving talks. We are open. And so please, if anyone's interested in Queensland Maritime Museum, who wants to come join, uh, talk to us and listen to us on the, uh, and listen to our talks on the 14th, you're more than welcome to. If anyone would really like, the, you know, if you're available and are able to get there, great. If you know people who might be interested, please message them and tell them to come along because it's a wonderful museum and it needs support. It needs a lot of attention and we want to give it as much support and attention as we physically can. Thank you very much, everyone. There will be live streams from Australia. We'll be doing live streams as we wander around. Take care. Thank you, Sean Quigley. Thank you, everyone. And um, take care. Goodness me, that's an, old, that, that's an old one. Right, and that's up to date, sort of. It's not online, but it's up to date. Thank you very much, Sharon. No, sure, Mac. It's if yeah, that, that, that you're not supposed to do that. You got away with that, Sean. You, you're an admin and you're special, but we're not supposed to let people into these places. But there again, HMCS Hyda were kind of. I had the advantage of them. They're lovely, but they. I was to put. I I, I had written the book on their on their ship, so you know, they were kind of happy to have me. Um, I haven't written the book on HMS, HMS Diamantina, uh, Diamantia. I have for HMS Vampire. It's going to be fun. Take care, everyone, and see you all soon.